Então, deve... Good evening, everybody. Uh, class is slowly joining on. Hope everyone was able to stay inside and stay warm and not have to go out and drive around today. So just a quick go? question, kind of a quick poll. I got I got six and a half inches out of my place. So put in chat, put in the chat box, how much snow you measured or think you got. Where would I find the PowerPoints that we do that we go over in class. Well, I six inches. I got. Um, I did email the PowerPoint Monday's class. I didn't email that out to everybody, and I'll I'll re-email it. Not a problem. And then I'll email tonight's class tomorrow under the assumption I'm going to get I'm going to make it in. They did close LCCC at noon today. Wow, 10 inches, college and I-25, 10 inches. Oh. And drifting, yep, definitely, and drifting. Dripped, dripped at my front door. Seven inches from Diane. Sarah, I didn't go outside. Don't blame you. <laughs> Don't blame you. Six inches. Six inches looks pretty consistent except for the i-25 college area which is with 10 inches that's impressive <laughs> five inches not five feet yeah well scott's bluff got 12 inches got a whole foot i shoveled three times yeah i gave up i shoveled once and 
That was it. And then again, after this is being recorded, just so you all know, and then once it's once we're done, I send this to my to the admin, and she edits it, does closed captioning, and tidies it up a little bit, and then and then we'll publish it. We'll put it on our website, the University of Wyoming Laramie County Extension website, and I'll give you that that address at the next class. And yeah, we can go back over the video recording and listen to the lecture. And I'll give you the PDF for it. The books are in. <laughs> yeah, the books are in, but <laughs> it's kind of frustrating. They're in, but you can't have them yet because you can't get to them, right? Well, I have 602 on my laptop. And I'm sure there'll be a few more joining up. So I'm going to share the screen. And so, of course, that goes blank. Okay. So can everybody see the PowerPoint program? Okay, perfect, perfect. So it's kind of, it's kind of entertaining to talk about growing vegetables with six inches of snow on the ground. But hopefully this will give you some tools so that when the snow does melt, that uh, you can be successful. And that's the whole point with tonight's lecture is, is to help those of you who are already vegetable gardening, because I know there's quite a few of you in the class, but I really want you to be successful. And all these vegetables have benchmark yields. And so the benchmark yields are going to vary from one to the other. But the whole premise is that you have better yields than what you've had before. So with that, we're going to get going. So just some, some fun facts, some fun trivia, if you will. The world's top grocery retail in 2021 was Walmart at $467 billion. And then Amazon came in at $239 billion, followed by Kroger, and then followed by Albertsons and Safeway. And then just another, like, wow, who knew? If Walmart was its own economy, it alone would rank as China's eighth biggest trading partner ahead of Russia and Canada. And I don't know, I couldn't find current data on that. So it's a little old, but I suspect that they're still in that league. And then, and then a fun interpretation, top US food processing companies, Tyson, Kraft, Pepsi, Nestle, and Anheuser-Busch. So this is the way I interpret this. Chicken, cheese, soda, chocolate, and beer. <laughs> so grocery store and food, ingredient costs are just 10% of the price. So a lot of that's going into marketing, a lot of it's going into just getting it into the store, the cost of putting it up in the store. So there's a lot of cost behind it. But the farmer, 10% of that price. Top three vegetable growing states, California, Florida, Georgia, and Texas. 
So California is going through some, some serious flooding. Florida just had a hurricane walk across it. Georgia has had several tornadoes. And Texas is the only one that's really kind of not dealing with some severe weather, but they are still in a drought. So I expect to see vegetable prices go up yet again. So another reason to want to grow your own vegetables. So a few gardening rules, and this is kind of like in my perfect world. Your vegetable garden would have sandy loam soil. You only work the soil when it's dry, so you don't ever want to work the soil when it's wet. The soil should be warm. Vegetables like to grow in warm soil. There's a few exceptions, but for the most part, 75 to 85 degrees is the soil temperature. And I, I do measure that soil temperature. I have a little digital thermometer that I use, and I just, just take the soil's temperature to see what it's doing. I go down about two to three inches, and, and I know immediately what's going on with the soil temperature. Lower pH, vegetables like a more acidic soil. So they like that six to seven is neutral, of course. And so we try to keep it a little bit lower. And again, peat moss is probably one of the better soil amendments to add for vegetable garden and trying to lower that pH. And then watering. Watering needs to be really, really consistent. It's gotta be just the same time every day, the same amount every day, because vegetables really need it to be very, very consistent. And vegetables are not drought tolerant. And that is, again, one of the biggest things I run into with low yields is that inconsistent watering. And fertilizer, do not use miracle Grow. Make your own. miracle Grow is just the wrong, wrong nitrogen. And you're gonna end up with insect pressures and problems. And, and, and just sort of, Growth that you really don't want, you know, not the right kind of growth. And then weeds, weeds are thieves and they're going to take nutrients, they're going to take the sunlight, they're going to bring in insects, they can hold pathogens. So weeds are really need to be rooted out. And no one likes to pull weeds, that's just a dreadful chore, but that's something that's got to be done. And so one of the ways that I combat my weed problem is I use a mulch. I can use straw, I can use leaves, grass clippings, but my favorite mulch is just plain old black plastic. And hopefully Monday's class, I can bring some to show you, or at least in the, the um, drip irrigation class, one or the other. Wind, I try to get my vegetables, a little bit of a break from the wind. I'll put up straw bales, um, trying to grow a little bit more of a windbreak for them. So I, I try to keep them out of just the really strong winds. And then, of course, in, in a perfect world, <laughs> morning sun is best. Afternoon shade is fine. And an afternoon shade is just perfectly fine. But you really want that morning sun. Okay. Our growing season, again, can be really short. Had one year where it was 89 days. Last year was close to 140 growing days. And so we measure that from the last frost to the first frost. Typically we have cool nights. And again, about every 10 years we are going into a drought. So we're just, we're just now coming out of that drought. I hope we stay out of it for a while. So some vegetable gardening rules. Number one reason for low yields is typically the watering. And again, vegetables are not drought tolerant. They don't like to dry. They want their soil to be consistently moist. And a drip system or soaker hose is the best. If you're, if you're throwing the water into the air with one of those oscillating things, you're losing anywhere from 40 to 60% of your water before it even gets to the ground. And then if you're throwing the water into the air, the wind is blowing it away or it's evaporating before it ever hits the plant. And then it, then it hits the top of the plant and it's got to run off those leaves and it's got to run down to the soil. 
So you want to keep the water on the ground because we, we absolutely have to be a lot more water efficient than what we've ever been in the past. And even though we might be coming out of um, a drought, maybe, we're, we're never really out of a drought at all. Okay. Um, so question, comment, timing every day, train the plants to every three days, or it depends on the heat. So I water every day. I've got it on a timer. We'll talk a little bit about those too. I start to water late morning. And I want my vegetables to warm up. The, the gardening myth is that you water before the sun rises or right at sunrise. And, and it's just too cool out for the plant to take up that water. And so it's not, again, it's not a real efficient use for vegetables. For your lawn, it's perfectly fine to water it when it's still dark out. But vegetables, they need to warm up. They need to be functioning. And then you give them some water. And especially for tomato plants and peppers, they really, really demand to be warm, warmed up by the sun. Dew should be off the leaves. And then you water them. How long do you water? Depends on your soil. So know your soil. Well, you'll get to know your soil a little bit better in Brian Sabati's class. And you'll know if you have light texture soil or medium, heavy clay soil. And all of those different types of soil really kind of demand a different approach to watering. So it's hard for me to tell you exactly how much, you know, how long do you water. I'm on a light textured soil, so I'm on a very sandy loam soil. So I'm careful with my watering because it does have a tendency to percolate through the ground very quickly. So I water appropriately for that. But when I start my plants out in the spring, I'm watered every day. If it's hot, dry, and windy, they're getting watered every day. I only water them once a day. That should be enough. And I'm also doing it with mulches. So I'm conserving the water as best as I possibly can. Okay, soaker hose. Soaker hose is, is fine to use. The only downside to soaker hose is that you really don't know how much water is leaking out. So it's kind of like your best guess on that leak. You're going to want to monitor that soil. You can actually buy tensiometers so you can take um, the soil moisture levels with a tensiometer. And they're not very expensive. They're um, you can mail order them a lot of times. I think Johnny's seed should have some of them in there. So you can you can actually find out how much soil moisture you've got with a tensiometer. Don't let this, again, it's a vegetable garden. Don't let it dry out. <clears throat> but that is the wetting pattern of a soaker hose. And the fun thing about it is that you can plant on both sides of that soaker hose. So I'll plant one row of like lettuce, and then another row of beets because they're good companion plants. Beets put all their energy down into the ground, and then lettuce shades them. And beets need cooler soil to be happy, but you can, you can companion plant on either side. So a row of carrots, another row of lettuce, or a row of spinach. And, and so you can hop back and forth on this soaker hose and have a row of something on either side of it. And that way you're becoming, you're very efficient with the space and the water. Um, tensiometer. And it's, it's just a device to measure the soil moisture. This is drip tape. This is, I like using drip tape. I use it, I've been using it for almost 20 years now. And I actually have some drip tape that has survived that long and is still functional. But the water comes through the tube and it gets caught in the channel and it kind of goes through this maze and then it drips out. It's just, a, it's a metered leak. And 
what I use is a half a gallon an hour. So I know precisely how much water is being leaked out. And I have it on eight inch on center. So there's, so it'd be like, there's a, an emitter there and then eight inches later, there's another emitter and another eight inches. So I know exactly how much water per line I'm using and how much water I'm using per hour. So in my garden, when I, especially when I do potatoes, I'll leave the water run for an hour and a half for my potatoes, but it's, it's a big line. It's almost 75 feet long. So that's a lot of water over time. And my, in your worst case scenario when you're watering is always the last emitter on the line. Because everybody else is getting it first, right? It's the guy, it's the emitter at the very tail end that doesn't get as much water or as much pressure. So you kind of water for that worst case scenario, the guy at the end, the emitter at the end. And again, we'll work with drip tape. Uh, I've got all sorts of drip tape so that you can look at. We'll put a drip tape kit together. And so we'll, we'll be able to get, have some hands-on experience with using drip tape. Okay, timers. This, this is a must in your vegetable garden, is a timer. And this timer is going to allow you to water consistently. My timer comes on about 10 o'clock, 10.30 in the morning, and then an hour and a half later, it turns off. So I know exactly how much water, how long it's run, so it's, it comes down to precision irrigation. And that's really where you've got to be with your vegetable garden is, a, is precision irrigation. So you're putting the exact amount of water per plant over time. And you do it to start off every day. As the season progresses, you might back off depending upon if it's a cool summer or if it's a hot summer. So you've got to watch that weather. But this is your best friend, and this allows you to go on that weekend vacation and know that your vegetable garden is getting water or go on that two-week summer vacation and know that your vegetable garden is getting water. It's, you know, the tragedy that I hear is I left the neighbor kid in charge of watering and caring for the yard, and inevitably they come home and it's, the garden's wet but dead. And then they look at you, the kid looks at you and goes, well, I watered. Yeah, you watered once. <laughs> so timer, they're not very expensive. So they start around $40 and go up from there. Usually run on a battery or two. So usually around the 4th of July, I take the battery out and put a fresh one in because I want, I want that to be <laughs> reliable. <clears throat> Okay, another reason I run into for gardens that didn't quite produce what they should have or failed gardens, is the assumption about your soil. And the comment I hear is, I know it's just bad. I know my soil is bad. It's like, well, how do you know your soil is bad? Have you had a soil test done? Just because it's brown, the soil is brown, doesn't mean it's bad. So again, a soil test, is really important and it depends upon what you've amended it with. And again, vegetables want a very low salt soil. So no manures, no, no compost that's gonna be salty. So be very careful with anything that comes in a bag, cow in a bag, sheep in a bag, mushroom compost. You know, the stuff that comes out of the big box stores, you gotta be very careful with it. And that's why I always tell people to amend their soil, which is something as simple as peat moss. It's not salty. It's going to lower the pH. And the only time vegetables should encounter salt is when you eat them, not in the soil. So this is, this is kind of a real world thing. This came in a couple of years ago. And the guy came and said, I knew the soil wasn't good. So I wrote about eight 
bags of compost into a 10 by 10 area. So 100 square feet, 10 bags of compost. We planted squash, melons, and mom wanted some corn. Well, nothing has grown. It popped up and has barely grown. The corn is about six inches tall. The melon's about the same. I know it's the soil. Well, at this point, I'm agreeing with him. <laughs> then I asked him, did you get a soil test first? No. So he did get a soil test. And now you all have gone through a couple classes, and so you, you know these numbers. The pH, the soil pH was 7.6. What do vegetables like? The electric conductivity or the salts, the EC was 14. So if we go back a couple slides, moderately saline, it's right here. And what do vegetables want? Right here. So this is why right here, the electric, con electric conductivity or salts. This is why the vegetable garden failed. Is there an EC meter for, for home use? Yes, there is. And uh, there's also a pH meter for home use too. And a lot of the catalogs will sell those. And soil organic matter was 7.8%. Wow, nice. What surprised me is that the sodium absorption ratio is only 5.2. I really expected it to be a lot higher with that pH and that EC. So that was that was in his favor. The nitrogen, the NPK, almost 30% nitrogen, almost 40% phosphorus, 104% potassium. And so this is what's driving that EC. So again, you've got to be really careful. And just because it's in a bag and, and the big box stores are selling it, it doesn't mean that it's safe or that it's good for the garden. It just means that it's something on the shelf that they can sell. They sell lime too. What do you think about the compost from compost from facility in Cheyenne can it be used in a vegetable garden? I would ask to see if they've taken any soil, you know, any testing of it, if they've tested their compost and if they've got the test results so that you can see them. And if you tell them you're a master gardener, they're gonna go, okay, I understand. And they'll get you, if they have the test, they'll get it to you and then ask, are you putting manures in the in this compost? They've they've had problems in the past by putting manures in there. They were putting horse manure in and they were just having a lot of problems with it. And I think they've stopped doing it, but do ask. So my soapbox again, you guys got this the other night. Always see it in the spring and traders free, come get it. We've cleaned our horse corral. It's been in a pile. Free, come get it. Put it in your vegetable garden. Yeah, don't do it. You will, you will have weeds that you will never get rid of, and it'll drive the salts. Horse or cow manure, you know, E. coli, salmonella, listeria, um, parasites. Just, just say no. Just don't use it. And then a oh, master gardener sent this to me. <laughs> a friend suggested horse manure on my strawberries. I'm not doing that again. I'm going back to whipped cream. <laughs> so food safety should always be important when you're working with your vegetables. When you harvest them out of the garden, you want to cool the fruit or the vegetables as soon as possible. So we call it field heat, and you want to get the field heat off as soon as possible. So that means getting a big tub of water, you know, or a big bucket of water, and immediately get the soil off of that, wash them off a couple times, and then into the refrigerator, except tomatoes. You don't want to put your tomatoes in the refrigerator. 
Wash your hands, wash the veggies before you peel, toss the outermost leaves of lettuce or the cabbage, and you want to store around 40 degrees, except for tomatoes. Tomatoes and cold don't get along. I'm pretty sure that tomatoes from California start off really tasty, but they put them in a cold storage facility and then they put them in a cold semi-trailer and it's that cold that changes the texture of a tomato and it makes it it makes it kind of mealy and it loses its flavor from being too cold. So tomatoes are the ones that, you know, wash them off, but store them on your counter. Okay, again, fertilizer, make your own. Alfalfa pellets, sugar, fish emulsion. You wanna feed the soil, not the plant. Your vegetable garden, if you're not gonna make your own fertilizer, look for fertilizer with the numbers five, 10, five something in that range. That last number is potassium. Potassium is extremely salty. There are times when you do need potassium in the garden for your tomatoes and your peppers and your potatoes. But for the most part, you want to keep that out of your garden. You want to keep that low. Hey, designing a garden, Dennis the Menace. Instead of trying to grow vegetables, why don't we just plant some pizzas? So, <laughs> designing a garden, again, in a perfect world, sunny location, five to six hours of sun per day. The, again, the, the assumption is that a vegetable garden needs eight to 10 hours of sun a day. And it's not necessarily true. East sun is best. Afternoon shade really helps them, especially peppers where they're very prone to sunburn. It should be well-drained. You don't wanna have the water pooling, but you do want to keep the soil moist, protected from the wind if at all possible. You've gone through site analysis now. So is this a microclimate area? Is this a low spot that's gonna get frost, you know, or stay cold, or is this gonna be up on top of a hill? You know, what side of the house is it on? You know, what are the trees? So go back to your site analysis and look at your yard and, and make sure that you're not putting it in an adverse microclimate area. And then what are the soils? After Brian's class, you'll have a much better idea of the soils and what you're dealing with. And then convenience of location. I put this in after doing a yard call where the wife was saying, I, I want the vegetable garden right here up against the house. And the husband looked at her and said, no, I want it way back out there. Way back out there on the five acre lot was a long ways away. The, the farther the garden is from your house, the less likely, well, the more likely by the end of the year, it's gonna be out of sight, out of mind. If the, bar, if the garden's closer to the house and closer to where you're, you're gonna visually see it, it's gonna visually nag you, that's the convenience of location. <laughs> because if it's way out in the back, you know, way out in the back 40 by August, it's way out in the back 40, right? And it's gonna be a weedy mess and you're gonna give up on it. So the closer it is to the house, the better. And then the garden matches your climb. I always start off thinking I've got all the time in the world. And so I put in this monster garden. And by the end of the summer, I've lost the battle with at least half of it. So the garden matches your time. And then grow vertically. So what does, what does that mean, right? Grow vertically, grow up. Tomatoes, you can trellis tomatoes. You can trellis cucumbers. Your cucumbers should be trellis. Just just period, you should be trellising your cucumbers, your, um, of course, tomatoes. Um, I have trellis winter squash, green beans. I try to do pole beans, so I grow them up. So one side of my trellis might be, so I do, I take these flexible cattle panels and they're 16 feet long and 48 inches tall and they're metal wire and they're bendable. And so I just make an arch out of one. And on one side, I'll grow one vegetable. On the other side, I'll grow another vegetable. So <laughs> a, um, 
I make that that trellis work and earn its keep. But I try to go vertically, and then underneath my trellis, there I can grow my salad greens. I can grow things that like to stay a little cooler. Beets and carrots like to have their roots kept cool. So all that can be grown in the shade, and that's perfectly okay. So what do you want to grow? Make a list. Put down, you know, tomatoes, peppers, sweet corn. I mean, just make a list of what you want to grow. Make a list of what your family will eat. Plan your garden on paper first. So make a map. Draw out a map of what you want that garden to look like. How are you going to water it? Drip tape, soccer hose, you know, no, you're not going to throw the water into the air. That's wasteful and it's inefficient. And then plan on a variety of plants in your garden. You need flowers in there. You've, you've got to have flowers to bring in the bees. And you're going for the native bees. You're going for your orchard mason bees. You're going for the bumblebees. And those are the ones that you really want to bring in because they're going to be the best pollinators for your garden. Bumblebees wake up early. They like it cool. They work in the cool weather. Orchard mason bees, same thing. The European honeybee is not a cool morning critter. And it wants it warm outside. Honeybees... So European honeybees are a tropical insect and they want it in their perfect world. It's 85 degrees all the time. And that's, that's their happy temperature. So they're not going to be the morning bee. They're, they're going to be the afternoon bee, but there's a lot of vegetables that need to be pollinated in the morning. So you want to cater to these guys. So I always have like zinnias, cosmos and alyssum. Alyssum is an awesome little ground cover to plant because they support seraphid flies and those little guys go after aphids and so your pollinator garden also acts to bring in the good guys that will go after the bad insects so make the good insects multitask for you they're pollinating your your vegetables but they're also taking out the bad guys and then rotate your garden you always want to rotate those vegetables to a new location in the garden. And you never want to plant the same thing in the same spot year after year. So in other words, if you go, well, this area is dedicated to just tomatoes. Uh -uh. You've got to rotate that every year. It should go into a new area. And especially for the potato growers, that absolutely has to be in a new location every year because potatoes just have an affinity for disease issues. So this is why it's really important to have a map of your garden so that it makes rotation a lot more logical. So the families, you want to rotate them in families, and you could actually do this slide as a map for your vegetable garden. And you've got your, your nightshade family, which is your eggplant, potatoes, peppers, tomatoes, and then legumes, your cuberts, your coal crops. So you can actually use this and as a method of rotation. And so say year number one is the nightshade family. And, and so this is your year number one garden. And so in year number two, you're going to move the nightshades to where the legumes are. Legumes from cubers and cubers to coal. And the coal crop comes to where the nightshade family was. So that, that would be a type of rotation you could do. But rotating should be a must. I rotate every year. I grow a lot of potatoes. I'm super careful about where I plant them every year. And I'll actually, I actually have a 10 year rotation plan for my potatoes because I just have such a respect for pathogens that potatoes bring to the table. And it's not necessarily a good table. Um, can we have flower beds near, but not in the garden? What's the max distance? So a flower garden, a flower bed, you know, as long as it's close, reasonably close, five feet, 10 feet away, you know, even if it's 20 feet away, that still works. I wouldn't go, I wouldn't go a whole lot further than 20 feet because remember you want them, you want to give them reason to come into your vegetable garden, but you want to keep feeding on them so they stay there with you.
Okay, so this is one design. This is a raised bed that you can walk into. And easy to work with. You just pick up those little tiles, those little stepping stones. The whole thing can be rotate, um, rototilled, soil amendments. So you got um, whoop, a touchy touchpad. You have <laughs> you have tomatoes, got some herbs, some carrots, some, some basil, some onions, some more salad greens, some carrots, flowers in there. So this is a salad garden, a raised bed salad garden that is, again, you just walk right into it. It's pretty cool. Um, you need to rotate container potatoes as well. So if you're growing in a container, that's just really a whole different set of challenges. I think growing in containers is really challenging the water and containers are gonna dry out really quickly, depending upon what you're using. Plastic containers are fine, clay pots. You almost have to water clay pots three times a day to keep things in there happy. But at the end of the year, you really should be dumping that soil out and then put all the soil in one big pile, turn it, amend it, renew it, because you can't keep planting year after year in a container and not work with that soil because it's just gonna deplete very quickly. And you really wanna bring in some good microbiology. So dumping it out on the ground, you know, have a place for it in your yard where you can dump it and then amend it. But yeah, containers are kind of kind of a challenge. Okay. Another garden design. This was, and if you look at the color of the soil, it's kind of a cool gray, a pale, cool, cool gray. So it doesn't look like it's going to do much. This was her first year with this vegetable garden. Rotate, you know took the back 20 feet of, of the property, rototilled it, amended it a little bit with peat moss. And you can see how she's done the drip lines. There's a, a main line coming in and then it goes off to laterals and then each bed has a set of, of, so of um, drip, a drip tape in there. This was her first, we sat down, we mapped this out in the office. This was her first ever vegetable garden. And she was in, we talked about this weekly. This, this was very cool for her to do this. And she was ex so excited when stuff started to pop up. And then this happened in mid-August and she'd come in and go, what do I do about the zucchini? <laughs> the zucchini plants were just getting huge and the leaves were ginormous and they were taking over and, it, and that's normal that's just normal it's like well next next year give them a little more room but the garden was very very successful I had her making her own fertilizer she had everything on a timer so it was easy to take care of and it did just marvelous for her she got a really nice yield for the first time and the soil just looks awful and that's one of those where you can't judge the soil by the way it looks. It's easier to slowly amend it and fix the soil than try to assume it's bad. And then try to fix it after you've assumed it's bad and put too much compost in there. Okay, another garden bed. These are all raised beds. And this is, they're about two feet tall and about three feet wide. And they're about eight to 10 feet long. And there it was, I think she had like eight of them. So this was, this was quite the adventure with a raised bed garden. And you can see the diversity in each bed. This front bed here, the one that's closest to you with the marigolds, these plants are green beans. And so they're very chlorotic, they're, they're anemic, and it's because they're not taking up nitrogen. And so green beans need to have an inoculant with them, and it's a rhizobium bacteria that you inoculate the seed and the soil with. And that allows that plant, helps that plant take up nitrogen because that rhizobium forms a symbiotic relationship with the plant roots. And so it's easier for that green bean 
to take up nitrogen, the leaves should be deep, dark green, not this lime lemon color. Also, it'll improve your yields. And you might say, well, my yields are pretty good. Yeah, uh, probably not. Probably not. Uh, not if the plant's that anemic and struggling. Let's see, cabbage, some sort of um, like collard greens back in there, more marigolds. She never took the walls of water off. Those were all tomato plants and pepper plants back in there and then eggplants. She never took any of the walls of water off. And that's okay. That's okay to leave the walls of water on. So this is kind of the disadvantage to doing a Zoom vegetable gardening class because I bring so much stuff to class for you guys to look at and play with and, and not having that ability is a little frustrating. But you can see she's got, she's done some sort of trellising here and she's growing nastasium, nastasiums up there. I'm not pronouncing that right. But those are edible. The flowers are edible and have a, a peppery flavor to them. They bring a lot to a salad. They really make a salad very quite delightful. She was also growing a squash up these, up this little trellis. And this is the cattle panel I'm talking about. This is the 16 feet long, 48 inches tall, and it's flexible. In this case, she's cut it to fit her raised beds. I would have just bent it as a trellis and then grown something up either side of it. Her cabbage looks lovely. She's got eggplant in here. So the only downside to her garden is she hasn't really planned it out efficiently. And so rotating the garden is very difficult because she has um, a nightshade in with the cabbage and, and really all the nightshade families should be together or in two beds so that when you rotate it, you just pick everything up and move that whole concept to a different bed. But otherwise, just amazing, just an amazing garden. Okay, design a garden. So we've already kind of gone through this with our site analysis class. When you do that, remember North Voice points to the top of your page, points to the top of the map, um, vegetable families together, Irrigation watering system, make sure you have walkways. I see a lot in high tunnels where it's just one solid mass of green and it's like just a solid carpet of like salad greens. And so it's, you can't get in there. The whole premise is that it's so dense. You don't need to, you don't need to weed, but then they have a special machine. They go in there, they push it through and it's like a little rotary lawnmower and it just mows the salad greens right into a catch bin but there should be a way for you to walk through. Black plastic mulch. So if I just go to the hardware store, I usually go up to Capital Lumber and those um, bunks of wood that they get are covered in plastic, in, in a white tarp, plastic tarp. And the underside of them is black and they throw that stuff away. So it's free black plastic. So, I just ask if I can have it out of the bin and take it home. I cut it so it fits the space. And I've had some black post plastic mulch that's lasted about six to seven years. So it is long lived. I've got holes in a lot of it that are custom fit just for growing either peppers or tomatoes. So I just find the right one, put it down, put it over the top of the irrigation. And sometimes I'll mulch in around the, the openings. So again, um, I have some pictures of this too, so it's not quite such a mystery. So there's some black plastic, and this is some that I got out from the lumber yard. Put it over the drip irrigation system. The tomato towers are just strictly there to hold it in place without it getting blown away. Then you did a trench along the edges of that plastic and you're going to tuck those edges in those trenches and then backfill it with soil so that it doesn't blow away so it'll look like that usually 
you'll want to have that whole area just covered in black plastic. Or you can just come back in with straw or grass clippings or leaves and just cover that space. Because again, the whole idea is, is not to have to weed, spend so much time weeding. Okay, vegetables. Life expectancy would grow by leaps and bounds if green vegetables smelled as good as bacon. Vegetables are a must on a diet. I suggest carrot cake, zucchini bread, and pumpkin pie. There you go. And then little kid's looking at his mom going, carrots, tomatoes, lettuce. What's wrong with a row of cheeseburgers? And then the little boy's looking at his mom going, are there any chocolate flavored vegetables? There is a chocolate pepper, but it doesn't necessarily taste like chocolate. It's kind of a color. Can black plastic affect soil temperature? Yes, and I want it to. That's how I get my soil up to 85 degrees. That's one of the, the benefits of using black plastic is that I can really get that, that temperature up. And how do you work mulch with squash and pumpkins? Beautifully. Those two go, all that works just beautifully. I'll put the I put my drip irrigation down first, then I put the black plastic mulch over the top of everything, tuck it in, which is, which gets really interesting. It's, it's quite the exercise. I get it all, I get all the plastic down on top of the drip irrigation. I then either cut holes in it or I've already used, I'm using what I had for a couple of years. I just direct seed squash and pumpkins, my winter squash, my summer squash, and my pumpkins. I just direct seed all that. I don't try to start it. I, I've started them before and I've direct seeded them and they the seeds catch up with what I've started in the house. So I, I just don't mess with that anymore. These guys, the squash and pumpkins are long season. They need 110 days of growing. And of course, we've already gone over with how short a growing season is. So when you get something that needs 110 days, <clears throat> you are pushing the frost. And for squash and pumpkins, it's okay if they take a frost. But the, the beauty of growing them on black plastic with the, malt, with the irrigation underneath it, they're getting exactly how much water they need. They like their soil hot, so they've got warm soil. You're not weeding. You're not having to go in there and, and try to weed in amongst all the winter squash and pumpkins. So they're growing on the black plastic, they're cleaner. You're not having insect problems and it just works out beautifully to grow them on top of plastic. Okay, the difference between vegetables, fruit, not well defined. Foods are generally considered the, the edible part of a plant that contains seeds, and vegetables may include stems, roots, tubers, leaves, and other plant parts. So, kind of loose definition there. A little botany. <laughs> it's really kind of silly, all of that joy over the latest comic book. But then I remember I have the same reaction when a new seed catalog arrives. So my seed catalogs usually start rolling in around October and I haul them up to bed and that's my nighttime reading. How did that work last summer in the heat? It just worked fine. I didn't really didn't have any problems with it. And again, I, I'm, I'm working on the soil. I want the soil to be warm, especially for my tomatoes and peppers. If you're at altitude or some place where it's cool all the time, you can put black plastic down for, I usually use it for my green beans and my cucumbers because they also want it hot, so, so warm, 85 degrees. is So when I say hot, 85 degrees is what I'm talking about. Seed stock, open pollinated seeds. So there's a lot of different options and Open pollinated is, is interesting and is kind of fun. If you're saving seeds, if you've got open pollinated tomato and 
another part of your garden, you've got an open pollinated tomato and you want to save those seeds, you're going to have a, a new hybrid. You'll have your, you'll, you'll start developing your own heirloom tomato. <clears throat> Hybrids cross between two parents that give offspring with very uniform characteristics. This is how you develop disease resistant, increase earliness or yield or vigor improvements. So I, I go for the hybrids typically. Heirlooms are fun, but I find that a lot of times my, my hybrids are gonna outperform. Heirlooms. This is another one that's got a real loose definition. Old type of plants that haven't undergone modern breeding so in other words, someone was able to just grow the same thing in the same area without it being influenced by outside plants. And there's cucumbers that are that way. There's one called Boothby's Blonde that's an old heirloom. And those seeds are saved by the people that are using them. So they have a lot of tensiveness to them where they haven't been hybrid. So, hmm. Okay. Okay. Again, storing seeds. Really, really important that you have a cool, dry place to store them. And I, and I joke about the crisper bin or the crisper drawer in your refrigerator, and that's what it's for. But that really is the perfect place to store your seeds. If they're in the garage or the garden shed, those that heat and cold fluctuations are going to kill those seeds. So. Consistent temperature is really, really important. If you've got a basement that stays consistent within 10 degrees, that's okay. You can put them in the freezer. That's going to be okay. But I find that they really do last a long time in a refrigerator and the crisper drawer. I, I'm still using pepper seeds that are well over 10 years, corn, green beans, Tomatoes, they've all, they're all in the 10 year age range. Peppers, I find only, pepper seeds, I find have only lasted about five years. Onion seeds, they're good for a year or two, and then after that, they give up. So, so even if you're trying to do the best for them, not all of those seeds are going to want to survive. And it's just the nature of what they are. Okay, within the vegetable world, you've got cool season vegetables. And these are ones that they germinate below 60 degrees. So your snow peas and a lot of your salad greens, they'll all germinate and start growing around 45 degrees. They don't do well above 75 degrees. Your snow peas, again, do not like heat and they're really prone to powdery mildew when they get too hot and too stressed. So cool season vegetables will tolerate cold soil. They can be hardy, withstand a frost. So think about like your broccoli, um, Brussels sprouts. If you grow Brussels sprouts, they absolutely have to have a frost in order to bring out that sweet flavor. Same thing with mustard greens and um, well, any, and collards. They have to have a frost. Well, they should have a frost on them in order to taste better, to bring out that sweetness and kind of drop that bitter flavor to them. So these guys, mid-April is when you can start planting them. So this is their list of cool season vegetables. So these ones can also be grown in the shade. So that's kind of the beauty of cool season. Those are your broccoli, kohlrabi, cabbage, collards, garlic. Garlic you typically plant in the fall and mulch it in really, really well and then cover the mulch so it doesn't blow away. And it likes it likes this kind of weather. Parsley, kale. Kale does kale you can start growing at the end of the growing season and then let it get a little bit of a frost to make it a little bit sweeter. Radishes. Leeks, onions, lettuce, spinach, peas, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. Uh, fun list. But again, these guys can all be grown in the shade. 
Yes. So Yvonne asked, can you plant cool season vegetables in late summer for fall harvest? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So vegetables that kind of fall in between. These guys can be planted in early May. Beets, carrots, celery, parsnips, potatoes, Brussels sprouts, chard, rutabaga. Again, Brussels sprouts are really long season. They need 110 days. So they can be a little challenging. Those are ones that you plant them, you kind of forget about them until after you get a frost and then harvest them. And I typically just harvest the whole stalk and bring that in and and just pull the little sprouts off of them. Beets grow best in cool soil. That's they're going to grow bigger. They're going to grow um, sweeter. They'll have better flavor in cool soil. Carrots. I've started my carrots as early as April, and they've done fine. They will take forever to germinate in cold soil, like three weeks. And about the time you give up on them, go, oh, they've just rotted and died. Then they sprout. Celery, you can plant that early. Celery is one that I would encourage you to start from seed and then transplant carefully because it has a taproot on it. Warm season vegetables. These want their soil warm. These are the ones that want 85 degrees soil temperature. And that's where that black plastic comes in handy. And then I can I have a little digital thermometer to run around with and I take the temperature of the soil so I know I know what um, exactly what I'm dealing with. And again I use black plastic for almost all of these. And the only ones I don't use black plastic for are peanuts, but the cucumbers, I always grow cucumbers on black plastic, even if they're, they don't want to trellis, that I want them up growing up a trellis while I'm off the ground. Squash, winter squash, especially on black plastic, really gets off to a great start. Squash is a long season. That wants, that's another 110 day vegetable and so I, I plant it. I don't want to mess a lot around with it. Eggplant wants it wants the soil warm. Sweet corn, if if you can, if you're just doing a little spot of sweet corn, black plastic works. It's a little fiddly trying to do it with black with plastic. Definitely your tomatoes. You definitely want your tomatoes growing on black plastic. Again, your irrigation goes underneath that black plastic, and and you will have a really good crop if you can if you do it this way. Okra for all for all of you from the south who like okra, it grows here. It's 55 days. It's fast. I, I, I the times I've grown, I couldn't keep up with it. Sweet potatoes. This is another long season, but you can grow them here, and it's kind of hit or miss. There's been years where I've had just beautiful sweet potatoes and other years where I have not So it's, it's unpredictable. You don't know what you have until you dig them up. But that's another one you can um, double crop or companion crop so you can grow your sweet potatoes and then uh, you can grow them with your cucumbers. Peppers, definitely on black plastic. Muskmelons, I grow muskmelon and watermelon. I grow those up a trellis. They're up off the ground, but there's black plastic down there because they want their soil hot. And muskmelons and watermelon originated from the Kalahari Desert. They're grown a lot in Israel, Middle East. So they really want that, that hot soil, 85 degrees. Peanuts are easy to grow. They're fun to grow. You are not ever going to get a yield like you do in Georgia, but they're they're just kind of fun to say you did that. Okay, don't overestimate the length of the growing season. Plan for 90 days, hope for more. So what's this, what am I talking about? 90 days. When you look at a seed packet, 
there's a lot of information on it. And so if you flip it over, you're going to see that it says matures in 65 days or matures in 120 days. Corn, the big box stores, for whatever reason, like to sell a corn called Silver Queen, which is 90 days. If our growing season is only 90 days, that means you're not going to be harvesting corn until September. And really, I, I want it a whole lot sooner than that. Peppers, 70 days. Winter squash, 80 days. 80 to 110 days. Pumpkins, 120 days. So how do you make all this work? And, and I would encourage you to start seeds. You know, start your plants from seeds. Tomatoes are easy, easy, easy. They germinate in about five days. And it takes them about two weeks to get to, well, it takes them about three weeks to get to what we call transplant size. And so it may have, three or four sets of true leaves on them. So if we go back to that botany lesson, when a seed germinates, the first thing it puts out is cotyledons. And then it puts out the next set of true leaves. And then and then it's off to the races and it's growing. So about, about the fourth, third or fourth set of true leaves is gonna be about transplant size. So now you've got five days plus figure three weeks. So 21 days. So now you're at 26 days. Then <laughs> you're going to put it in the soil. You're going to take it off your garden, put it in the soil, and it's going to sit there and go, oh, my world just changed, and I don't think I like it out here. So it's going to sit there, and it's going to put out roots, but it's not going to grow a lot. So now you've got this adjustment for transplant shock, and that can be three to four weeks, and four weeks for peppers is not unusual. So now add all that together. Add that for tomatoes, add that five days for germination, add 21 days to transplant size, add another 21 days for transplant shock, then add your 65 days. So, so now you get a feel for how soon you should actually start growing or starting that plant from seed. And says from Aaron, I use the Almanac planting calendar. This is a good, reliable source. Um, it, it's their best guess as to how things are gonna grow. Some people swear by the farmer's, farmer's Almanac. I, I don't ever use it. I don't grow by the moon either. That's, that's too challenging here in Wyoming. We don't have a no long enough growing season. We have this little tiny growing season. So I, I go strictly by the math, I add everything up. The goal is I want, I want tomatoes and I want sweet corn on the 4th of July. Well, that really tightens that up. So that means that I really should have things in the ground by early May, but I should be prepared to protect everything. So now I'm using walls of water, I've got the black plastic down, I cover the walls with water. I try to keep everything warm because we all know that May can be really schizophrenic with its weather. So you've got to be really prepared to really protect everything. And then you've got to have a backup plan. Okay, so Dave, can the three to four week transplant stress be reduced with larger pots soil for the tomatoes? You can, you can try that. It, it's usually you've changed its environment in the ambient air temperature, and now there's wind blowing on it, the nights are cool, it's, it, you've lost that, that consistent in the house growing environment. And so now they're outside and that's why the walls of water are beautiful and floating row cover, which is a spun, spun bound, non-woven, lightweight fabric that you can put over things or you can put sheets over them. So planting that early in the spring, you've got to have, you gotta have plan B. And you can't take a vacation, you can't leave, you've got to babysit that vegetable garden until it's up and running. And we're past that, that June 1st date, which is theoretically, even by the 10th of June, we still have a risk of a freeze. So you've got to be ready to cover and protect. And, and you know, last, 
last year, last May 20, what was it, 23rd? For two days in a row, it dropped down to 27 degrees at night. That was a hard freeze. That was hard on our trees. But for a vegetable garden, that was very frustrating. But there's there's ways to protect against that. There's a There was a professor down at CSU, David Whiting, who put his tomatoes in his garden in February. And he was harvesting tomatoes by the 1st of June. But he he had plan A, B, and C. He, he was ready. Okay, the other way you can look at this. Um, can you recommend a variety of sweet pepper that does well here? here. Um, actually, I'm going to say no, Yvonne. I'm going to let you guys figure that out. And hopefully we'll grab the... Johnny C catalog and talk about that because I want you to figure out what's going to work best for you because as soon as I tell you oh you know this this or this you're not going to be able to find it you're definitely not going to find it in the big box stores and you know it may not be something you really want to grow so anyway at break I'll go down and grab the my Johnny C catalog and we'll go through through the catalog. Another way to look at this on your green beans, whole beans, any of those guys, um, snow peas, when you see that bloom, when you see that blossom, seven to ten days for harvest. So this again is where you might want to have a log in your garden or close by your garden or on your phone. So that you can make a note and say, I'm seeing the beans flower on June 25th. So plan on a week later or 10 days later that you're going to be out there harvesting. So watch those flowers. Watch for the flowers. Corn. When you start to see the silk and the tasseling, you're, got, you're looking at three weeks to harvest. Cucumbers. When you start to see the blooms, you've got two weeks, depends how big you want that cucumber to get, and then you're, then you're harvesting. Peppers, when you start to see that blossom, anywhere from 45 to 70 days. So that's a huge range, 45 days to 70 days. At 45 days, you can harvest that pepper when it green but all peppers will turn red or yellow some of them turn purple but that extra 30 days there is for it to turn to that color and so when peppers go from green to red that red that bricks level the sugar level goes up exponentially and so they really become a lot more flavorful to to eat pumpkins I, again Pumpkins, I don't, and winter squash, I don't pay much attention to. I plant them. I make sure they're getting water. I fertilize them once a week, and I wait for a freeze, and then I go find what's, what's down there. Summer squash, zucchini especially. This will get away from you in a heartbeat. When you see those blossoms, five days. Five days. Yeah, PJ's going, oh, yeah. Five days, mark the calendar, or put a note next to the plants, five days. Otherwise, if you miss that, you're gonna have that that five pound zucchini, which that's not so bad. I mean, it makes great bread, right? And you can, you can do all sorts of fun things with, with giant zucchini. Tomatoes, again, 35 to 60 days, once you start seeing that bloom. And zucchinis like to hide. Oh my gosh, they're experts at hiding. Okay, what to plant? Plant what you plant what you're gonna eat. I have planted things like kohlrabi and turnips for my husband, and I, not my favorite. Plant what's needed. I don't know why, but I like to plant potatoes, and I get a certain amount of 
enjoyment, I guess, out of going, I just harvested 500 pounds of potatoes. I don't need 500 pounds of potatoes. So what will, what the family will eat. So we got Dennis up here. See, Mom, even old Ruff won't eat broccoli. And then down here with Jeremy, limp green crucifilis devil. You have the head of a flower, but the aroma of a gas station men's room. Oh, vile weed, I reject you. What are we having besides broccoli? And then I want to grow my own food, but I can't find any bacon seeds. So grow what, grow what you're going to eat. Grow what you want to eat. So we're going to take a break here. And I am going to run down and find my seed catalog. So we'll come back in five minutes. And everybody get your Johnny seed catalog.
Okay, so is everybody ready to go again? Or are we still taking a break? Okay. All right, so I have a different cover on my Johnny Steve catalog, but um, you all should have taken one home. And if you go to page three, and, and I'm hoping that everyone, we all have the same. <laughs> I used the one that came to me and then I realized after I handed out the seed catalog that you all have a different cover than the one I do. And I'm, I'm hoping they didn't really change anything. But if you go to page three or it starts at the top, start growing with the best resources. So this gives you, this talks about the seed packet and, and reading the seed catalog. So they talk out at the, stop, at the top the variety description key. So they give you the variety name, the hybrid status. So is it an heirloom or is an F1 hybrid? And then a life cycle code, code which is annual. Typically going to be an annual unless you're into the flowers. And Yes, I have plenty of catalogs. It's going to have on there the days to maturity. So it'll give you the it'll give you the name, the writing name, and then right underneath the writing name, it'll be the days to maturity. <clears throat> Talk about the disease resistance. Tomatoes, this is really important. Um, same thing with peppers, but tomatoes especially, you really want those tomatoes to be resistant to certain viruses. And, and a virus, if your tomato gets a virus, you're, you're not gonna see a lot of growth problems per se, but you'll look at the fruit and that fruit will have like a bullseye type modeling on it. And once that tomato gets a virus, there's no plant medicines for it. You can't cure a virus. You can't get rid of it. And it so alters the flavor of the tomato that it's unedible. So you have to do that thing no one wants to do. You have to pull that tomato plant out and throw it away. So that's, so having a tomato that's resistant to viruses is really important. And they do talk about different disease resistant codes on this page on the the resource page and pepper model virus potato virus y there's uh, a tobacco mosaic virus and most of these viruses are transmitted by insects so this is again why it's really important to have a pollinator patch or pollinator friendly plants flowering plants in your vegetable garden so you can bring the good guys in so they can take out the bad guys because a lot of your aphids, your leaf hoppers, there's psyllids, there's some other ones that carry viruses. And if you've got the good guys there, they will take out the bad guys. And then how you fertilize your vegetable garden is also gonna help you combat insects which can vector viruses and other problems. So I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit here and we're going to talk about 
tomatoes. And so the tomato, native to America, native to South America, per the US Supreme Court near the end of the 19th century, apparently they had a couple extra time on their hands. The tomato is legally a vegetable. Botanically, it's a fruit. So tomatoes are fruits. <clears throat> Over 3,000 varieties. Oh, gosh, so many choices, so many choices. And, and that's why I find, you know, people that go to the, the big box stores and they buy the same tomato varieties year after year after year. They get, you know, better girl, better boy, bigger girl, whatever. And, and there's 3,000 varieties and they come in colors. Pink, red, white. Yellow, green, purple, black. You know, why, why settle for just what the big box stores think they want you to own? Heirlooms, hybrids, they come as cherry, grape, salad, sandwich, paste, beefsteak, varieties. But the standard tomato plant should yield 10 to 15 pounds or more. All of your vegetables have a benchmark yield. So whatever whatever you're growing, you should get a minimum amount back. And if your tomato plant only gives you a half a dozen tomatoes, it is missing the mark by a mile. Even your little cherry tomatoes, usually I hear people complaining about how prolific they are and they can't give enough of them away. So all of these plants have a benchmark yield that they are giving back to you. So tomatoes are either indeterminate, which means they're gonna grow and grow and grow until something tells them to stop. And so that's gonna be like a frost or your pruners. So that's always gonna be something there to tell them to stop growing because otherwise I've had my indeterminates get as, as long as 16 feet. So they want to grow. Your determinants are your tomatoes that only grow so so tall, so big, and they stop. And the determinants are the ones that you want for your containers. These guys can be as small as 18 inches tall. They can be as big as three feet tall, but they're not going to really exceed three feet and they're good for containers. A tomato can have a growing season between 50 and 100 days. When you start getting into 100 days, now you're past your 90-day growing season. Plan on 90 days, hope for more, but you really don't want a tomato that needs 100, 110 days. The tomatoes that want a growing season that long are going to be your beefsteak tomatoes. And that's why you, it comes October and you're still looking at this big green tomato that's not doing anything. And so as much as we want a tomato that takes up most of the piece of bread for a BLT, they're not practical to grow here because we don't have the growing season. I've grown them in my high tunnel and even in the high tunnel, I struggle with them. Tomatoes are a warm season plant. They want that soil 85 degrees. That's the black plastic. They want their water consistent. They want low first number fertilizers. So if you're using miracle Grow on them, which has got, now that first number is like 18, 18% nitrogen, they're gonna grow and grow a lot. You're gonna have the biggest, best tomato on the block, but you're not gonna have any fruit or your fruit isn't gonna ripen in a meaningful time. So you're gonna be going into September and you still have big, hard green tomatoes on there. Well, that nitrogen is tying up the tomato's ability to turn red. So that's why I teach you guys to make your own fertilizer. And if you don't wanna make it, make sure you find a fertilizer that's really low with that first number, like 5% nitrogen. Drip irrigation is a must. You never wanna water overhead. If you're watering overhead, you know, like with an oscillator, a sprinkler, a sown water up into the air, that water is now falling on the leaves and it's got to run off the leaf to get to the ground. And so you're, you're only getting maybe 10% of the water that needs to be there, but you've overwatered the tomato plant. So 
this is where blossom and rot comes into play because it's in our soil it's not a calcium problem it's a watering problem and it's typically the plant gets overwatered then underwatered and then overwatered and underwatered and so the watering is inconsistent and you want that's where the timer comes in handy and you want to keep that water on the ground the other thing tomatoes they want to be watered later in the morning like like 10 11 o'clock i don't start watering them until 11 in the app in the morning that skin especially on your ripe tomatoes that red skin you know just as you're thinking you know, i'm gonna i'm gonna harvest this tomato and then you go to harvest it and it's got those cracks on it or maybe it's split cherry tomatoes are notorious for splitting it's because you're watering too early in the morning and that skin is still cold and it's not flexible it's not it's not doesn't have that ability to expand so you really want to water later when it's warmer the tomato itself is warmer the air is warmer and and so it can expand with that water again too much nitrogen produces leaves reduces fruit yield do not use miracle grow do not let your tomatoes wilt i i've run into people that go well i only water when they need to need to be watered well when do you know they need to be watered well when they're looking a little droopy yeah no that's going to make the tomatoes very unhappy none of these plants nothing in your vegetable garden is drought tolerant so you've this is why i really you know get on my soapbox about getting a timer the tomato in this picture was grown by someone here in laramie county and that is a striped german johnson tomato she did grow it in a high tunnel and she didn't harvest that until October. So it did take her a long time to get that two pound tomato. Okay. Tomatoes. So in your Johnny Seed catalog, <laughs> we need to go to, I have page 112. So if you grab your Johnny's, if it's not page 112, it's it's going to be the tomato section. So they have Johnny's grows their own seed. They're they're not a they don't source seed from other places. They actually grow and and sell what they grow. So they have test gardens. They've got people, other people growing for them. So they have a lot of information and, and they keep very tight control of what they do have and what they sell. So I, I like that from that respect that they're growing what they sell. So they do have tomatoes just for high tunnels and greenhouses. That doesn't mean that you can't grow them outside. But what I want you to, to look at is on the days to maturity for these tomatoes. There's one on the page of 112. It's called Ruby Dawn. And Ruby Dawn is 60 days. So from the time you, you germinate it, gets a transplant size, you transplant it onto your soil, onto your garden, theoretically, in a perfect world, two months later, you're going to have tomatoes. You should have red, red tomatoes ready to go. They're not going to be real big, they're going to be six to eight ounces. But that still makes a great salad. You can still slice them and put them on your sandwich. So you want to look for tomatoes. Again, I want you guys to be successful. So you want to find tomatoes that have a shorter amount of growing time, days to maturity. When you start getting into 85 days and above, it's it gets more and more difficult to have a good harvest. So on page 113 in Johnny's catalog. There's a whole section on growing the tomatoes, and it has a germination guide at the bottom. And that germination guide tells you what that optimum temperature is for that seed to germinate at. And if you've got 86 degrees, 85 degrees, that seed's going to germinate in about four days. It's really going to go fast. And then, and then, if you turn the page to 114, 
It talks about small fruited tomatoes. And so these are your cherry tomatoes. These are short to maturity. Um, there's one here for 58 days, 55 days. Sakura, 55 days. Um, prolific yielder of bright red, medium large cherry tomatoes. Kind of like that. <laughs> that pretty much describes most cherry tomatoes. Prolific. But in 55 days, you're going to start harvesting. You're going to start having sal you know, tomatoes for your salad and tomatoes to snack on. And then on the next page, they've got the determinants or the bush tomatoes. And again, these are the tomatoes that are good for container gardens or your raised beds. So you've got, um, and again, I would encourage you to, if you're gonna start your tomatoes from seed, start something that you're not gonna find in the big box stores or the garden centers. Celebrity is one that is, you know, you, you can find that in the store. So I'd encourage you to try to find something that you've never tried before. There's one called Galahand, 69 days. So that's even shorter than Celebrity. Delicious early determinate beef steak, seven to 12 ounce fruits. So that's gonna be a good sized tomato that's gonna take up your sandwich. In 69 days, it's a determinant, so it's not gonna get huge. You can grow it in a container. And then if you notice down at the bottom, it says growing field tomatoes. That really means growing tomatoes in your backyard. And this is gonna give you a huge amount of information. I, I teach out of Johnny's and Territorial because if you had to buy a book, a gardening book with all this information in it, it would be a very, very expensive book. And this is free. So you gotta like that. My vegetable garden's got to got to beat the price of the grocery store and that includes my literature but I want literature that's going to be spot on and research based and so Johnny's and Territorial, Burpee, um, Park Seed, a couple others are going to be research based and I like and that's that's the important thing for us. So if you look down where it says growing field tomatoes it talks about their culture so they wanna be grown in medium rich soil with a pH between six and 6.8 preferred. So again, they want that acidic soil and, and they don't want it. So, so again, you've gotta be careful with your, your compost and, and that mushroom compost, you don't know what the pH is. And, and so that was what that one person's problem was. The pH was 7.8. Those were just flat out unhappy plants in that pH, but the salts also took them out. So the soil with a pH of 6.0 to 6.8. Um, yeah, fertilizing accurately since excess nitrogen causes rampant growth, rot, and delayed ripening. Right there, okay. So a lot of information here. Days to maturity from transplant, and gives you a whole sorts of information about about transplanting, starting them from seed, trellising. Really encourage you to grow your tomatoes up a trellis of some sort, and prune heavily. Prune those leaves, open them up, let the air flow through them. You're not going to stunt the plant by by pruning it. You will help it, and then. It also tells you on the very bottom that a packet of seeds from Johnny's is gonna have 40 seeds in it. So 40 seeds could be a lot for a backyard garden. That's where that crisper truck comes in handy. And, and so you only start 10 seeds or five seeds. Well, you, you leave those seeds in the packet that you don't use and you put them in your crisper drawer for the following year. And then it also gives you whole tomato resistant codes. The viruses are the ones that just, my gosh, you know, um, tomato mosaic virus, tomato spotted wilt virus, yellow curl virus. 
yellow crow virus is um, comes late in the season. Very frustrating. So <laughs> I, I could almost spend the whole class just talking about tomatoes. They're one of my favorite things to grow. They can be very rewarding, very challenging. But do go through this because the choices are amazing. Don't, don't settle for what the big box stores want to sell you. There, there's so many other wonderful flavors in here. And I am going to buy seeds for us so that we'll have vegetable seeds come plant propagation. And I'm going to get a tomato called Wins All. It's W-I-N-S hyphen wins all a l l and it, it's about a 10 ounce tomato but it will produce when i the last time i grew it it produced 50 pounds of tomatoes from one plant 50 pounds from one plant that was just phenomenal that's that's what you want your tomato plants to do you want them to keep giving and keep even if you have to find yourself going to your neighbors and and giving your neighbors tomatoes Taking them down to, you know, the Comia shelter and, and giving them to, if you take vegetables to the Comia shelter, make sure you give them to the cook because that person will incorporate them into the food. If the vegetables are just left on the table, they just will rot. <laughs> so, so they have to be cooked before the people down there will eat them. But if you do give them away, that, yeah, just, just make sure you give them to the right person. And and plus, it's kind of fun to be able to, you know, have bragging rights and saying, yeah, I grew a, a tomato called Damsel, or I grew one called Abergel, or I grew Lemon Boy, grew Wisconsin 55. I'm also going to try to get seeds from Heinz, and I have grown Heinz tom tomatoes, and so think of the ketchup. So Heinz tomatoes are going to be a paste tomato, so those are a lot of fun to grow. You can say, yeah, I grew Heinz, Heinz number 1574, and it was really good. So, so it's, it's a lot of fun to grow odd-named tomatoes. Be different in your garden. So on page 118 is the striped German, 78 days. Amazing flavor. I, at least the one I have and the ones I've grown, I've just found that they're just amazing. German Johnson, Striped German, they're both really good. 75 days, 78 days. That's short enough that you will, you should have tomatoes for your BLT or your salad or your tomato sandwich by the end of July, August. So you'll still get a good sized tomato, a 10 ounce tomato, and have really good flavor with it. And then your paste tomatoes, but you want to try to avoid the ones that, that are starting to get up into the high 80s or 90s. And Johnny's has gotten a whole lot better about keeping those numbers low and not trying to think that everyone's got a 110-day growing season. But again, your your beefsteak tomatoes, they're just they need 110 days. They don't like a lot of nitrogen. So if you've tried to grow beefsteaks and you haven't had good luck with them, that's that's why. And then cherry tomatoes on page 122. If you if you can, the the yellow cherry tomatoes are going to have superior flavor to the red ones. So like there's a cherry tomatoes that are bush. They're determinant. So gold nugget, 56 days. That's a nice yellow. And the yellow ones or the orange ones are they're gonna have flavor that you're just gonna stand there at that plant and just graze. Okay. Tomatoes. Um if the color is off again. If it be a like fire engine red tomato and it's not, it's kind of orangey or it's kind of a speckled orangey red, it's a potassium issue. And trying to get, and at that point, it's really hard to get potassium into the soil and up into the plant. So you're, you need to find a potassium that you can actually spray 
onto the plant, onto the leaves, so that the leaves take that potassium up and use it. Sulfur, a little sulfur in the soil, a little sulfur goes a long ways, but that does help boost the flavor. And boron, again, a little goes a long ways, but that does help with the ripening and prevents, helps prevent fruit cracking. But again, you want to also monitor your watering and the watering should start later in the morning. Okay, blossom drop. This is when daytime temperatures really get kind of crazy. And I saw a lot of blossom drop. You know, that's where the blossoms start off white and all of a sudden they turn brown and fall off. That's blossom drop. And that's when the temperatures get above 90 degrees or maybe the nighttime temperatures drop below 55. I've been in people's greenhouse or high tunnel and they're so pleased about, yeah, get it up to 100 degrees in there. Well, the tomato doesn't want it that hot. And so the blossoms are gonna drop off. So temperature control is challenging in a high tunnel or a greenhouse. And it can get a little fiddly in that respect. We can't control what goes on outside, but in our area, it's really rare that we get above, above that 90 degrees. Blossom end rot, that's a moisture issue. That's, uh, again, put your, put your whole garden on a timer and, and that's gonna help that out. That's gonna help prevent that. Epsom salts, that's magnesium sulfate. That's gonna tie up calcium. So skip the Epsom salts, that's a gardening myth. I have no idea how or where that started. It's it, it's a train I can't get stopped, but you don't need Epsom salts in your garden. And gypsum, we talked about that the other night. Good source of calcium sulfate, but it's gonna increase the salts over time. And if you're adding gypsum to your soil, I just get a soil test before you add gypsum. Because that's, that's an area where if you start adding gypsum and you get too much in there, re reducing that or re reversing that one, it's gonna be really difficult. So get a soil test at the beginning of the year before you start planting so that you know where you're at. And, it, and that you can base your amendments on that. But don't just add stuff because that's what you've heard in the gardening rumor mill. <laughs> so just get us all done instead. Okay, overwatering, lower foliage, gonna turn yellow, wilting, um, salt damage, again, it's gonna look the same. So again, drip or silker hose on the timer will solve 90% of these problems. Oh, tomato hornworms. These guys just blend in so beautifully. It's just incredible. If you have night blooming flowers like morning glories or four o'clocks, you are going to have the sphinx moth. And those are the moths that are gray and they look like hummingbirds. But they're the, they're the moth that lays the egg that turns into the tomato hornworm. So, you can mitigate that just by not planting those, but if you do find them, they're really easy to, <laughs> so I say they're really easy to grab a hold of and pull off. If you've got chickens or your neighbor has chickens, just feed them to your neighbor's chickens or your chickens. Okay, if you cut into your tomato and you look in and it's, and it's got white inside of it, that's, that's another indicator of potassium being too low. And so the flavor is going to be a little off. And again, you need to get a potassium that you can just foliar spray. And they're available. You might have to go down to Fort Collins to Pro Colorado and get a foliar spray version of potassium. Okay, chilies, peppers, 1,500 varieties. Semester's about 2,000. I will also be bringing pepper seeds to class. I have um, Anaheim peppers from Catch, New Mexico. And so we'll 
Everyone will get a chance to grow those if they want. So Hatch, New Mexico is kind of the chili pepper capital of the United States. So all peppers will change to red as they become mature. Can be fussy, will not withstand a frost at the end of the season. When I start seeing the forecast for the temperature to drop down to 45 degrees, it's, it's like I know the peppers aren't gonna deal well with that. And so I'll actually go start harvesting. And I can bring the peppers inside. And even if they're green, they're gonna start to turn red in the house. We'll drop cold, we'll drop their blossom. If it gets too cold, they go back to just growing. It's transplant shock. They do not like to go from that, that warm in-house environment to outside growing situation. And they'll sit there for, for almost a month. And it's very frustrating. But once they get growing, they're, they're gonna be happy. So in your perfect world, daytime temperatures around 80 degrees, night at 60. They want their soil warm, 85 degrees soil. If you can get it there, black plastic for that. Fertilizer, 510.5, cell pollinated. These are peppers that came out of my garden. This was off of three plants. So again, my pepper plant should be yielding about 10 pounds of peppers per pepper plant. So let's see. Going back to Johnny's. Okay, in your Johnny seed catalog, page 80. Again, I, I would encourage peppers are easy to start from seed. They can be a little slow to germinate. They like their soil right around 85 degrees for germination. So, and we'll talk about how to warm that soil in the seed propagation, the plant propagation class. They can take eh, about 14 days to germinate and they, they don't transplant well. Warm soil, black plastic, fertilizer 510.5, self-pollinated. So we don't have to worry about insects for pollination. But again, in, if you go into Johnny's seed catalog on page 80, and that should be the pepper page. And at the bottom, they have the whole culture requirements for growing peppers. Peppers thrive in well-drained fertile soil with a pH of six and a half. So again, your vegetables, 99% of them are gonna want an acid soil. Um, yeah, if possible, maintain soil temperatures of 80 to 90 degrees. That's for germinating. Pepper seeds germinate slowly in cooler soils. First true leaves appear, transplant seedlings into two inch shelf type containers or four inch pots. And then they want their room temperature around 70 degrees. So the whole art science of growing and starting your own seeds can be a little fiddly, but you guys are master gardeners, right? So this is all, this should all be just fun, fun to do. And then Johnny's has also got a chart on page 81. And so they talk about the variety. So they give you the name, then they give you days to maturity and it says right, unripe to ripe. So unripe means a green pepper and ripe is a red pepper. So Unripe is 50 days and ripe is going to be 70 days. And, and again, keep in mind our growing season will be 90 days. So we really want to try to find these peppers that are going to give us a good reward fairly early. So here's one called Ace, 70 days to red, extra early, high productive standard, huge yields of medium sized three to four lobed fruit. So this is going to be more of a bell. It grows well in cool climates. And yeah, that typically describes us. Seed packets are going to contain about 25 seeds. So again, if that's more seeds than what you want to use this for this year, you can store them in the crisper drawer. 
keep in mind they're only going to be viable for about five years. So there's a lot of a lot of really fun ones in here. Um, I like the fact that they give you the green to ripe date. And then they talk about what color they're going to be, the disease resistance, the fruit size, and they even talk about the plant size. So for those of you growing in a container, this one called Ace would be a good one for a container. And then they have the, the um, kind of the specialty ones on page 82 and 83. Round of Hungary, it's a pimento. Pimentos, easy to grow. Paprika peppers, so you can, you can grow a paprika and take it all the way to red. Bring it in, let it dry, and grind it for your own paprika. Peppers come in different sizes, the Lunchbox series. And then they have the hot peppers. So on page 84 is the hot peppers. <laughs> so fun story, I grew the Lunchbox series and then I also grew one called Padron. And I grew them fairly close together to each other. And I go out there at seven in the morning and I'm grazing. So that means I'm out there, I'm eating peppers and I'm eating tomatoes as I'm going along. Well, I grabbed a padron thinking that it was a Melrose. And so at seven in the morning, when you eat a hot pepper, <laughs> it's better than caffeine. Next time, plant them farther apart. That's my, that was my take home. There are some fun peppers to grow. There's one called Jimmy Nardello, and I don't know if they've got it listed in here or not, but it looks like a cayenne pepper that would rip your lips off, but it's it's as sweet as, as candy. It's just amazing. So if you get a chance to find Jimmy Nardello, and I'll look for seeds too, so to bring them to class so you guys can try growing Jimmy Nardellos, but very, very sweet. It, it truly I mean, it's like eating candy. It's, they're wonderful. And so there's a lot of other types of peppers to grow. There's bell, pimentos, the sweet wax ones, anaheims, jalapenos. There, there's a whole bunch of other ones in between. So you don't have to grow jalapenos to have the heat. Like I said, I grew padrons. Those are, those are pretty spicy, especially at seven in the morning, but a lot of different varieties to grow. So don't, don't just rely on what the big box stores want to sell you because I don't care. I just want to make money. Um, what companion crop with these? I usually just grow them by themselves because I've got them on black plastic, right? I've got drip irrigation underneath them. So I don't typically grow them with much of anything else. I want them to have a lot of air circulation. Come midsummer, I'm going to cover them with a floating row cover, put some um, some Raimi, and I'll show you what that looks like. Because I want to, I don't want them to get sunburned, and so peppers are prone to sunburning. Okay, Anaheim, generally mild. Those, these are the ones you can stuff. These are the ones that they roast and then sell to you for stuffing. They are absolutely wonderful. You can or you can roast them yourself. You just put them on the barbecue grill and roast them and then you peel the outer skin off or you can leave it on and stuff them with cheese and bake them. Oh, that's absolutely wonderful. Anchos, these are ones you can dry and then crush them all up and have your own seasonings. Habanero, uh, habanero, jalapenos, serranos, those are all really easy to grow. So this is um, a bag of jalapeno peppers that I harvested out of my garden. They were every color. I had, so they were, I have the red ones, the green ones, I have a purple trying to change to red. 
again, three plants. I got 33 pounds of jalapenos. Jalapenos are kind of like Russian roulette with your food because it, it can be as mild as mild and it can be rip your lips off. Hot. So I have a friend who kind of appreciates that sort of play with his food. Plobanos. Again, this is another one that you can roast and stuff and eat. Lovely. Serranos. I think serranos have a little bit more of a fruity flavor to them, but they also bring a lot to the to the party from a culinary standpoint. Okay, what's wrong with my peppers? This is this can be a little challenging. You know, is it sunburn? Is it bacteria, fungal issues? Is it a bug bite them? Talked with them, long conversation on how he's growing them. It's really kind of he's he's on the right page as far as how he's growing. I look at these little indentations here, and I actually think that an insect came along and bit bit the pepper, and now you've got a bacterial issue going on here in conjunction with sunburn. So I think it's a couple things going on with those, and it's not just one issue. But it can be hard to diagnose this sort of thing. This little pucker kind of gives is kind of my my key my clue that something bit it and I've got a bacteria issue. So again, um, how you fertilize and having flowering plants in there to bring in the good guys, a lot of times just helps prevent some of this. Okay, sweet corn. Sweet corn is, is easy to grow. I do grow it on drip irrigation. I pack it in tight. So they're eight inches apart. You know, my drip irrigation is, well, my drip irrigation is gonna be a foot apart. And then my drip irrigation is eight, every emitter, eight inches. So I put a seed at eight inches and then I put, um, they're a foot apart. So they're packed in tight. So when that pollen starts to, float around it I want it to just fall straight down these guys also want they're they're picky about their soil temperature sandy loam pH of around six and a half heavy feeders these guys are heavy feeders they want lots and lots of water they want lots and lots of fertilizer and these are one of the few that I'm going to say yeah this is this is where miracle grow that miracle grow you've got hanging around that I won't let you put on your tomatoes or your peppers, this is you that you're gonna put on your sweet corn. So, so back to Johnny's. Okay, in your Johnny Seed Catalog, page 25, sweet corn. Down at the bottom of the page, again, they give the whole growing sweet corn guide. I like to use treated seed. And a treated seed usually prevents fungal problems, helps assist with germination rates. There's no insecticides on there, but there is a fun fungicide. And I think that's important, especially in our cold soils. So plant untreated seeds when soil is at least 65 degrees. So again, how do you know when your soil is 65 degrees? You're going to take your, your little plant, your digital meat thermometer, and you're going to go out and take the soil temperature. And that's how you're going to know when you're at the right. And you might have to put black plastic down to warm that soil up. So days to maturity varies widely with weather conditions and planting dates. So a lot of these days to maturity are kind of a rule of thumb. But again, you want to go with a seed with a sweet corn that's got a, the number is smaller. So if we turn the page, page 26. There's a few other things that you need to read. You know, when you read your seed catalog, I'm now in the, the third column on page 26 under the word yellow. 
And in the description of a, of a sweet corn called Vision, it says excellent husk protection and good cool soil vigor. So that means that it's going to tolerate soil temperatures below 65. Then there's the one below it, and it's a white. It's called extra tender. Best at latitudes 38 and higher, good soil, good cool soil vigor. So remember, in the um, site analysis class, we're at the 41st parallel. So the Wyoming Colorado state line is the 41st parallel. So the 38th parallel is going to be like Pueblo. So this is going to do okay here. This will this will do fine. But again, if you go to page 27 in the first column under bicolor. There's one called latte and it's 68 days. So now we're starting to get into an area that we're gonna have sweet corn. And again, you wanna try to, you wanna aim for the 4th of July, if at all possible. So I'm gonna plant my seed, my sweet corn, middle of May. I know it's gonna take about 14 days for that seed corn to germinate. I might have warmed the soil with and put black plastic down. My irrigation's ready to go. I've got my fertilizer already in the soil, and which is usually just the alfalfa pellets. And I know that it says here, excellent cool soil emergence. So that, that's gonna tell me that 65 degrees or a little bit cooler, it's gonna tolerate that. I know that sweet corn's gonna take about two weeks to germinate in that soil temperature. And that means on June 1st, well, I'm probably not going to hit 4th of July, 68 days. So I'm looking like the 1st of, of August, but I think I can live with that. Sweet corn does, does not transplant well. You cannot start sweet corn in a, in a pot inside and then transplant it outside. It just doesn't tolerate transplant at all. And the plant is going to be stunted. It's not going to grow well. It's just not going to get any reward from that. So you've got to plant it direct into the soil. So you can try, you know, heating the soil up using black plastic and trying to kind of manipulate it a little bit that way. And what else? Um, under yellow on the same page of 27, 70 um, sugar buns, 70 days. Longest harvest period of all early sweet corn. So that means that it's going to, you can, you're going to hit that point where you see a tassel and you see the, the silk come out and you're going to say, okay, I got two, I got three weeks. Well, it'll hold onto that stalk longer and not turn to starch is what that means. And that's, that's really important because a lot of these sweet, these varieties, especially the heirloom varieties, the joke with the heirlooms is that as soon as you harvest that ear of corn, you need to be running towards that boiling pot of water and throw it in there because that sugar is turning to starch immediately. And so these hybrids hold the sugar longer and they're less likely to get starchy on the corn stalk itself. So that's what, that's what they're talking about with sugar bonds on page 27. And again, best at latitudes 38 and higher. We're 41st latitude. So this is going to do fine here. But then the one below it called Illusion. It's a white corn. Excellent cool soil vigor. 72 days. You want to avoid the corn that's in the 80 days or 90 days. And, and again, um, um, Silver Queen is... 90 days, 92 days, you're just not going to have that reward of sweet corn when you would like it. You're going to be looking at it and it's going to be September, it's going to be October, and you're going, oh, <laughs> what what I do wrong? You can also grow ornamental corn or dry field corn, dent corn, and that's on page 28. That is that is your long season. There's 100 days, 105 days, 120 days. There's the ornamental. 
There's miniature colored popcorn, glass gem, um, some neighbors of mine grow glass gem. It's beautiful. So you could grow that with an, in fairly close proximity to your short day, you know, your short to harvest day sweet corn because you're just going to pollinate at different times. And this is the ornamental and the, the dent corn or the corn you want to turn into cornmeal. That you need to leave that on the corn stalk until it dries down completely. And so a lot of times when you're if you're driving in Iowa or Missouri or back east someplace and you see it's October and you see the corn still on the stalks and you're thinking, God, why hasn't that farmer harvested his corn yet? What's going on? Well, he can't harvest it because the moisture levels in that field corn are too high for him to harvest. And if he harvested it, it would just mold in the bins. So that's why you're seeing it on the stalks. And that's that's kind of the tricky thing if you're going to do your own um, cornmeal or your own popcorn is it's got to be dried. And leaving it on the corn stalk is a way to let it dry. You can bring it in the house because we never produce enough that we have to worry about that. But you can always bring it in the house and put it in a warm, dry area and let it dry on its, by its own. But by all means, try, try growing corn, cornmeal or popcorn. It's, I've tried growing popcorn, it's fun. It's not anything like the popcorn that they grow back in Nebraska, but it's still fun to say that you grow your own popcorn. It's kind of like growing your own peanuts, right? Okay. Sweet corn. Okay, number one yield killer for sweet corn is high heat and ability to pollinate, not enough water, high water requirements, very shallow roots. Roots on sweet corn are very shallow and it's not drought tolerant. And, and by the way, I will make this, I'll put this lecture in the PDF and I'll email it out to everybody. Um, again, water, got water, water, water. And this is one where you can use your miracle Grow on. You can, you can make lift, um, put it in a sprayer and spray miracle Grow right on the corn to get it to grow. It's not growing well enough. Um, yeah, <laughs> so there's a use for miracle Grow. Okay. Beans, green beans, there's hard beans, you know, those, the hard beans are your um, storage beans. Those are the ones that you're going to shuck and put in the jar and sometime later rehydrate and, and uh, put in a pressure cooker or crock pot or something. Oh, 1500 varieties, so many. Sensitive to high salts. So again, Going back to earlier in the lecture where the salts were really, really high in that guy's garden, um, nothing's going to grow because most of your vegetables are very sensitive to high salts. Shallow root system, most vegetables have a shallow root system. So that's why they're not tolerant to drought or going without water. And beans generally do not do well following cabbage or related crop. So on your rotation, make sure that they're not following cabbage or cold crop. And inoculant's a must. And again, it's a rhizobian inoculant. And we come back to class, you know, hopefully everything will be back to sort of normal driving wise on Monday. And I'll show you what a packet of inoculant looks like. You, can, you should be able to buy it in Johnny's Seed catalog, but I would encourage you to, to use that. And need potassium boost about mid-season. Hot. <laughs> so here's the challenge in Wyoming. Hot, dry, or cool weather may cause blossoms to drop. Warm season crop, not frost hardy. Again, when I, I'd like to grow the, the pole beans, because I can grow them up and, and get them out of the way. And I can grow them on black plastic because they want that soil warm. They like their air temperature around 70 degrees, the ambient air temperature, but they want that soil warm. Now let's see. Broccoli, soybean beans. Okay. 
pretty sure I did beans. And I did. Brussels sprouts again. Those are ones you plant, you just sort of forget, put them in the ground. Um, okay, found it. Page five in your Johnny Seed Catalog. You can grow artichokes too. And normally in California, they're a perennial crop and it just and they just grow forever. I mean, they're probably long with a perennial crop. But artichokes like, so here's the gardening conundrum. Artichokes like cool, misty weather. So there's an area in, yeah, exactly, PJ. There's an area in California that, that checks off all those boxes. So they like that high humidity, cool air. They like that that ocean air coming in. But they are grow, you can grow them here. They don't get ginormous like what you get in the grocery store. But they are a fun edible size. And then if you just sort of go, I don't want to eat that. If you let them grow, grow and bloom, they have this radioactive blue blossom that is stunning. And the bees will flock to it like crazy. Okay, back to beans. So beans, pole beans, are going to give you a bigger yield than bush beans. So if you're, if you're trying to put up beans, you're going to can beans, you're going to freeze beans, um, you're going to freeze dry them or just dry them. Your pole beans are the ones that are going to give you the best reward for harvest, harvest numbers. And, and they come in colors. Beans come in colors. There's purple. When you boil purple beans, they turn green. So, so they, don't, they don't keep that color. But it also, again, this gives you the days, 55 days to you're off to the races and you're harvesting your beans. And there's always going to be a few beans that hide, and you're going to find them later in the season that are like 10 inches long and look like tennis balls in there. Yellow ones. If you haven't grown yellow green beans, I would that sound like an oxymoron, yellow green beans. Yellow pole beans, Monte Gusto, 58, deep, 58 days, eight, eight inches long. You can harvest them as more of like a French fillet at seven inches. There's flat potted beans. Um, try the flat ones. They're excellent flavor too. If you come across the oriental yard long beans, worth growing. The yields are pretty low, but they have almost a walnut nutty type flavor to them and outstanding flavor. They're, they're worth trying to grow. They they a little fiddly, a little fussy, not big yields, but but from a culinary eating standpoint, they are just off the charts. Uh, let's see. Expect so if you're going to do the bush bush beans, um, expect from a 25 foot row, expect around 30 pounds. Pole again, pole beans are going to give you a bigger yield. I have never grown soybeans. Carrots. Um, again, these are a vegetable that they don't want high nitrogen. They don't want heavy soils. They want that sandy, loamy soil. They actually want um, not. I gotta tell you, they're not picky, but at the same time, they don't want heavy soil. They don't want rocky soil. They don't want high nitrogen. They don't like low fertile soil. And, and so they can be a little fiddly in that, but otherwise they're not very picky. I usually don't even bother to thin them. I just put them down. I get, by the way, you can buy pelleted carrot seeds. And so you can pr do precision planting with the pelleted seeds. Otherwise the little seeds are kind of hard to kind of meter them in. I don't bother to thin. I just pull them all out as a, as a group wash them off. The flavors are going to be everywhere from sweet, ultra sweet to a normal carrot flavor. They all work well in, veg in the salad. 
and that's how I that's how I thin them. I I just eat I just eat the whole thing. Um, hot weather may stunt their growth. We really don't have much of a nematode problem in here, but again, your choices. Can you add sand to a small patch of soil to make it more loamy for carrots? So the, the trick would be make sure you don't have a lot of sand or a lot of sand, a lot of clay, because the clay and sand together um, is a bad combination and it will lead to soil compaction that's just horrific to get over. The best thing to add to a, a compost, like your kitchen compost, coffee grounds, you know, that sort of thing for a clay soil. You can modify and make soil in like a raised bed type situation. So you can actually mound it up and then run your drip on top. And then you can manipulate the soil to make it a little bit better. And so if you go to Johnny's, the Johnny's seed catalog, and you go to page 18, sorry, you go to page 16. Go to page 16. Um, again, carrots don't transplant well at all. So you're going to want to start these guys directly into the soil. I've, I will start them as early as April. They're going to sit there for a long time because they don't really like that cold soil. But as soon as it warms up, they're off and running. So I can get a pretty good jump on the season by kind of pushing it a little bit. And on page 16, they do have on the bottom, again, the whole growing carrots require well-drained soil, pH range, again, 6, 6.8. So they want that acidic soil, deep, loose, and fertile sandy loams and peat soils. Good moisture holding capacity grows the straightest and smoothest roots. So, so using that guide, you can make your own soil in a raised bed. And then if you look at the chart at the top of that page, they give you how long those carrots are gonna grow. So if you do a raised bed that's only six inches or four inches tall, which is just fine, then there's carrots that fit the bill for that. There's one called Adelaide, and that is 32 days to a baby carrot, which is very tasty, or 50 days to the full size carrot. But looking at the chart, you know it only needs about three inches depth. That should help you decide what you want to grow. If you've got fairly good soil and you want to grow really big carrots. If you look on page 17 and you look at the chart at the top upper corner, there's one called sugar snacks that grows to a whopping nine inches. So those are the kind of carrots you want to grow to can or freeze because their yields are going to be really, really good. And so here again, on Johnny's is going to tell you exactly how many, or approximately how many seeds in a packet. Packet is going to be 750 seeds, and it's going to plant a 25 foot long row. That is a lot of carrots. If you only want to use a few of those and you want to do like a five foot long row, or if you've got drip tape and or soaker hose and you plant on both sides of that hose, you can do kind of 10 foot out of a five foot long run, right? So what do you do with the rest of those seeds? Well, <laughs> you leave them in the packet and you put them in your crisper drawer. Yeah, yeah, all of you guys are gonna be not, probably dreaming about the crisper drawer in your refrigerator, right? Okay, containers, for those of you growing in containers, there's one called Atlas, it only gets about two inches. That's perfect for containers. So along with um, Adelaide and our, um, a couple others that don't grow that that tall, that grow that long, you know, when five inches, those are containers. That should work out just well for you. Storage carrots, so if you want to keep them for longer. But again, 
uh, it's going to tell you the days to maturity. Carrots are pretty quick in the garden. Then if you turn to page 18, this is where you get into your colored carrots. For those of you who haven't grown colored carrots before, give them a try. I have found that the colored carrots, the deep purple ones, the, the dark red ones, they actually taste better when they're cooked. They're okay raw, but cooking them brings out that flavor. And the original carrots were all colored. They were all the, the, the dark reds, the purples, the, the really odd colors. And it was with the breeding that we brought them into what we currently know as the orange carrots. But if you wanna do the heirloom carrots, that's really gonna be your purple, your dark reds. It is, it is worth the price to buy pelleted seed. It's a little more expensive, but that allows you to do precision planting, especially if you've got containers or you don't wanna grow that many. The seeds also store longer when they're pelletized. Okay. I don't, I have no idea how I'm doing for time. I, I could talk all night on growing vegetables because it's just such a, it's such a, a passion for me. So I'm going to quick check the time. Okay, I'm doing okay. It's a little after, it's like 8.25. And since you're all home and you don't have to drive home, that makes it a lot easier on everybody. Okay, potatoes. I love growing potatoes. I get carried away. So many different, again, so many different varieties to grow. Heirloom, Peruvian, European, Asian, fingerlings, new cultivars. This is my root cellar. I've got 350 pounds of potatoes from 23 pounds planted. So again, rule of thumb, for every one pound of potato planted, you should be getting back 10 pounds. And this really comes down to watering. Potatoes come in different season lengths. You have your early season, 65 to 80 days, mid season, up to 90 days, late season, 110 days. Again, this is one that I don't really get excited about their growing season length. I know I can leave them in the ground. They can take a freeze, they can take snow. They're gonna be okay. So I don't, I don't, I don't worry a lot about that. And then when it comes to harvesting, I have a lot of people call and say, well, when can I harvest my potatoes? It's like, well, if you wanna make potato salad this weekend, by all means, dig something up and, and use it because there's really isn't a ripening type thing with them. They're just, they just continue to grow until something tells them not to grow. Okay, uh, Dave, a friend of mine plants these in small square straw bales, which sit on the ground and seem to yield well. So again, I weigh, I weigh or count or measure everything that comes out of my garden. So I know that I'm getting what I'm getting from one pound planted. I know that I'm getting back the right amount. So I weigh everything. I just have a little scale, I have a basket, I put everything in the basket and I weigh it. So I know, very picky about that. Okay, we will, I will answer that question. <clears throat> when you do get potatoes, make sure they are certified seed potatoes because they'll be free of disease. You do not want to use those potatoes that have sprouted in your pantry, even though it's really tempting because, well, they're growing after all, right? 
Well, you risk inoculating your soil with fungus or bacteria. And once you inoculate your soil with that stuff, you never get it out. And there, there's so many problems with potatoes that, that it's volumes. There, you can get a college degree in just growing potatoes. So back on my manure bandwagon, uh, manure in the soil for potatoes carries a bacteria with it that causes scab. So scab isn't, uh, and I'll show you a picture of what scab looks like. It's cosmetic. You can peel it off. It doesn't affect the flavor. It doesn't impact anything, but it just has kind of a cosmetic issue to it. So again, in your perfect world, sandy to sandy loam soil, potatoes want it acidic. They, they're as bad as blueberries. And their water needs are huge. They're as bad as corn when it comes to water. And this is where a lot of people fail with potatoes because they're not giving it enough water or they're trying to water it on top of the leaves and hoping that it drains down. It just doesn't work that way with potatoes at all. Now, these guys are a little bit more heavy feeders, 10, 20, 20. There's not a lot of potassium, which again is very salty, but you know, a little goes a long ways. I always amend my soil, I put all the fertilizer in, and, and I know that I'm really not going to have another chance to fertilize after the first, before I plant them. So looking at this picture here, if you're watering from above, then your water has got to drip off these leaves and it's got to be enough water to saturate this ground. Well, your seed potato is all the way down here. So this leaf canopy is really preventing the water from getting to where it needs, which is all the way down here where the roots are. I start my seeds, I start my seed potatoes early in the house. And so this is what's called a 1020 tray. And this is your standard gardening tray. It, it's not anything special. There's no um, holes on the bottom or anything. I cut the potatoes, I let them dry. So I've got an eye, I've, I've dried them a little bit, I've got I make my own potting soil, my own seed starting soil. And it's just, I, I buy the least expensive soil I can find in a bag. I let it freeze and thaw a couple of times outside. I then add peat moss to it and vermiculite, or not vermiculite, perlite. So perlite, potting soil, and, and peat moss and in equal parts. Mix it all together. I want a very light, airy soil. I don't want it heavy. I don't want it all peat moss because all peat moss will dry out really quickly. So you got to be real careful with seed starting mixes that are all peat moss. And so <laughs> you have a beautiful cat, by the way. <laughs> um, I want that seed starting soil to be very light and loamy. And so that's, and so when you look at the soil, you can see the little white pieces that are perlite. So very light, I started early and that gives me a little jump on the season, but it also turns out that it helps improve the yield. So if 10 pounds per one pound planted isn't enough of a yield, I, I'm still trying for, my goal is that two pound potato. And I, I've had a master gardener beat me on that one. So potatoes, I dig a big trench. I dig a big long trench. It's maybe 10 inches deep. You don't need to have a real deep trench or anything for potatoes, but I put them down. These are the ones that I've started in the house. I then take my drip irrigation and I put it on top, right alongside of it. So there's the seed potato, it's gonna put out its roots and I want my drip irrigation right next to that seed potato. So I'm watering in the trench. 
I then, once all that stuff starts to put out green leafy material, I come back in and I bury the, the drip tape or the soaker hose. I bury that and I start burying the potato leafy stuff too. And so there'll be just a, a, a peak of green coming out. So I keep burying everything. And you can see in the other picture, I've got the drip tape in the in a trench already and I'll start putting the potatoes in there alongside of it the ones that I haven't pre-sprouted and I just start burying everything and then I mark what I've planted because I, I can't remember after a while so this was 2020 <laughs> at Hill Storm in June and I thought it was kind of a cool picture because you could really see the plants and you can see how much they've grown by early June. And some of these, the center row is the one I started in the house. Uh, they're actually a little bit bigger and a little bit bushier than the other ones. Then I harvested early September. And so the ones in this box are purple Vikings. So I put my, uh, my, my passive aggressive tool there, the fork, to give you an idea of, of size. But you can see that potato next to the fork has got kind of bumps on it. Well, that's scab. And that's what scab looks like. It's just cosmetic. It scrubs off. And then my 1.7 pound potato. I've had 1.8. Uh, like I said, I've got another master gardener who managed to get the two pound potato. It comes down to water. And it's so important to have that water in the trench with the potatoes. If you're watering above, you're not getting enough water to them, bury the water line with those seed potatoes. Makes all the difference in the world. You'll have bigger potatoes, you'll have better tasting potatoes, and you'll have a better yield. Okay, any questions, comments, thoughts about other things to grow? And like I said, I, I'll talk about the whole produce aisle if you let me. Okay, asparagus, that's a perennial. Start those guys from roots. You can start them from seed. It's just going to take them long. And even when you start them from, from roots, you're still looking at two to three years before you can really harvest them. And the ones you want to buy have got the name Jersey in them. And Jersey refers to um, Rutgers University, which is where they have um, done a lot of research on growing asparagus. So anything with the name Jersey in it is what you want to try to grow. So is it best to water everything on the soil instead of plants? Yeah, you always want to keep your water on the ground. So drip irrigation, soaker hose. If you're throwing water in the air, trying to water things, trying to mimic rain, it's just, you're just not going to have the yields you should be getting. Beet, here we go. They like their soil a little cooler. They also want their soil pH right at seven. So this is, these guys are the exception to the acid soil. They want a little bit more neutral to alkaline soil. I will start planting these guys in April. They do fairly well in cool soil. They grow pretty quickly. And if we go to our Johnny's seed catalog, beets. Okay. Okay, page eight in Johnny's seed catalog. 
Again, they like their soil cool and moist, so consistent moisture. Don't over fertilize these guys. 5% nitrogen is all you want. And again, at the bottom of the page on the Johnny C. Keller beets, they give you the whole um, culture on how to grow them. Fast, great, first grade crop grows quickly in light or loamy soils with a pH over six. Cool temperatures produce the best, the best flesh color and it produces the best flavor in cool soil. When the soil starts to get warm, the flavor starts to drop and so does the sugar levels. So the other thing with beets is they come in colors. There's yellow and there's white. And the white ones, I think, are just a, just a smidge sweeter than the red ones. But they do come in colors. And so they're, you know, if you haven't tried a, a yellow or a white beet, give them a try. Seed packet, 350 seeds to a packet for a 23, 23 foot long row. So again, plant what you need, put the rest in the crisper drawer. They'll start the optimum range for germination. They will germinate in cool soils. They do best when it's a little warmer, but again, they taste better if they're grown in cool soils. That's beets. Um, too much nitrogen, they're going to be bitter. And Okay, from Yvonne, do you start peas indoors or plant outside directly in the garden? So peas, um, I'm pretty sure I talk about it, but peas are a cool soil plant. And so peas... Let's see, peppers, peas. So in your Johnny's catalog, if you go to page 78, it will say under their cultural requirements, peas are a cool weather crop. So these are definitely, you know, and some people, kind of joke about how early they can get peas in the ground and get them to grow. And, and so Mark is not unusual to hear some of the, the real hardcore vegetable gardeners talk about getting their, their peas in the ground. So peas will start to germinate around 45 degrees soil temperature. So again, grab that soil thermometer, take temperature of the soil and, um, and start planting. Peas do not do well once the soil warms up or the temperatures warm up, and you really end up with a lot of powdery mildew problems, which is which is definitely not good eats. And all you can do is pull those plants out of the ground, throw them in the trash, not your compost, and and then wait till this it starts to cool down a little bit towards the end of the season and start to grow them again. But again, March, April, not unusual. Start growing them. Okay. Um, so I had good sense with Adonami about three years ago. Yeah. It, and so in the Johnny's catalog, they do talk about growing soybean. And again, it's not something I've, I've grown. Not sure why. I tried that one. I grow peanuts for heaven's sakes. But anyway, um, beets. Back to beets. The tops are edible. You can either chop them up, throw them in a salad, or you can do them as a mess of greens. The only thing I will um, toss out about beet tops is that they're very salty. And so if you've got to watch, watch your salt intake, you might want to be careful with the greens because they are just naturally pack a lot of salt into those leaves. Broccoli, cool soil conditions, easy to grow, easy to grow. And they can. They can tolerate a frost. They can get snowed on. They'll tolerate a lot of that. <laughs> There's different types of broccoli. And some of it is just kind of 
miniature broccoli. So if you're trying to grow in a container, the miniature broccoli will probably be what you're looking for because they're not as big plants. And so broccoli, page 10. Again, this is easy to grow. You can start these as seeds in the house and then transplant them. They transplant just fine. Beets, on the other hand, don't transplant well at all. You want to direct sow beets. But broccoli, that's one you want to start inside and then transplant. So standard heading ones, cut them and they sprout back. So it's it, they just keep on, on delivering. Every part of a broccoli plant is edible. The leaves are edible, the stems are edible, the whole thing is edible. So just because you've cut off the, the head doesn't mean that you can't keep using that plant for salads and, and the stems are just as good as the heads. The, the mini broccoli, I have grown that and, that's, and I forget that it's miniature broccoli or mini broccoli and I keep looking at it going, Are you, what's wrong with you? So, but the miniature broccoli is good for, um, for your container garden people. I like growing containers. Cauliflower. Again, start this inside. Comes in colors. So on page 20 of your Johnny Seed catalog, There's, it comes as yellow and it comes as purple. It also comes as, um, as green, the Romanesco. And the Romanesco is just, it looks like something out of um, an Escher painting. They're just kind of very unique looking, but it tastes just like cauliflower, even though it looks weird. So I, I've grown the, the cheddar and the lavender. They're good. Eating, they taste better cooked than they do raw. But they're really easy to grow. I would cover them. I've covered them with um, the floating grow cover. Um, broccolinia. But that to me is one that you just chop up and you throw in the salad. I, if I'm going to grow broccoli, I'm going to grow the the big brothers, so they have a big head on, a meaningful head on them, because I can freeze it, I can can it, I can dry it. Yeah. Um, cauliflower likes, the, again, the cabbage loopers like broccoli and the cauliflower and cabbage, of course. And so I just cover them with floating row cover. And again, I'll show you what that looks like on Monday. So that they, um, keep the bugs off. But again, um, cauliflower is one where you, you cut it once and that's, that's kind of the end of the show. Um, cabbage, oh my gosh, easy to grow. Bugs love it, cover it. Or with a floating roll. I even once got um, those hair nets, those um, white hair nets that you see in food service and I put them put hair nets on them trying to keep the cabbage loopers off of it and it, the cabbage loopers can make you crazy those little white butterflies and let's see so the head size of the cabbage determined by the variety fertilizer spacing between plants and and you know, if you like to do sauerkraut or kimchi easy enough to grow your own cabbage they're actually a fairly heavy feeder, 10, 20, 10, 10% nitrogen. So they're a fairly heavy feeder. Cucumbers, oh, cucumbers. We'll talk about cucumbers and then we'll call it quits because I'll make you guys crazy. So in your Johnny Seed catalog, page 29. Cucumbers, lower soil, warm. Again, I will put black plastic down. I make them grow up and, and they do beautifully growing up on a trellis. They're cleaner. They're more uniform on a trellis. They have less bug issues. 
And again, 50 to 70 days when you start seeing the blossom, that's when you start to count the days. And depending upon how big you want, or how small you want them, just know that the blossom is going to be your key. Again, they want that long day. They want warm soil. And there's this one called lemon. So if any of you have ever grown lemon, a cucumber called lemon, they look like little tennis balls. Onions. Okay, David, we'll talk about onions. Um, lemon look like tennis balls. They are slow to get started. Slow, slow, slow. And you'll be entering August going, why aren't these guys producing? And then all of a sudden, it's like an explosion of lemon cucumbers, these little tennis ball guys. And you can eat them like cucumber or like, like an apple. Eat them like an apple. Okay. Don't like grout. They like hot weather. They like their soil hot. They're not... Um, drought tolerant like everything else. When it comes to the cucumbers, there's some there's some growing definitions, and again, Johnny spells it out really well. And you want to try to get ones that are are parthenocarpic, and that means they don't require pollination to set fruit. If you if you do have a lot of bees coming into your garden then the gynaceous and the monaceous are just fine. But if you don't and you want huge yields, then the parthenocarpic ones are going to be really well for you. If you have trouble digesting cucumbers, you know, you'll see cucumbers that are advertised as burpless, or I'll have people say, oh, I can't eat cucumbers because they give me indigestion. There's one here called striped Armenian. And the Armenian ones are actually a melon that tastes like a cucumber. And these guys get huge and are very, very tasty. And they're kind of your answer to, I can't eat cucumbers because they, they don't get along with my stomach. So those are, the, those are good ones. Then I'm going to skip to page 31. For those of you who like to do pickling, and you want to put up like, like uh, bread and butter pickles or dill pickles. There's a list here of pickles that are good for that. I've grown the salt and pepper ones, which are down on the bottom of the page 31. And they're comparable to ones called Boothby Blondes. And Boothby Blondes are a variety. And the year that I grew them, I had 60 pounds of Boothby Blondes from about five plants, four or five plants. That's huge. And, you know, I was giving those away to my neighbors. <laughs> so lots of good things with cucumbers. Again, the, the catalog really lays it out as to, you know, do you want them big? Do you want them little? Do you want pickling? Do you want slicers? Do you want the English cucumbers? So a lot of choices. Divas are really good. That's on page 30. Very flavorful. The market moors are huge. You know, if you want that big cucumber salad, market moors is going to fill the bowl. Mm, divas are pretty. That's a really pretty cucumber. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump to onions. Okay, onions, they need, again, they're very shallow rooted. They like their soil warm. Oh, I put 75 degrees Celsius in there. <laughs> By 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so the temperature determines when they start to actually, that bulb starts to thicken. So they, again, they want their soil warm. Day length is important to these guys. There's onions that grow like the Vidalias. They like days that are um, short. It's considered a short day onion. 
Then there's your intermediate day onions and okay. And then you can grow wall wallas here too. You can actually grow all of those different types of onions, and you're going to see them change and grow in size depending upon the length of the day. But they do like the temperatures warm. God, that's that's going to be crazy. There. But again, the temperature, once it gets above 75 degrees, air temperature and soil temperature, that's when that bulb starts to thicken. But the daylight has got to correspond with it at the same time. So patience, you should be able to grow really big size onions here. I like to start them. Um, I don't like the sets because I don't think you get a big enough of a yield or or the right size with the sets but you can buy them as started from seed and they, they look like you just bought a bunch of grass and they sell them in the big box stores you can get a hold of dixondale farms um, mike keith is also buying onions in fall and he can have onions available he's a, one of our master gardeners so buy them as started from seed don't start them from seed and expect to get a big onion because all you're going to get is like scallions. If you like scallions for your salads, by all means, start those from seed and you're going to get a nice reward from that. Buy them as starts or as uh, started from seed and they don't transplant well. So you want to direct sow into the soil. Again, consistent watering. They have very shallow roots, so you want to avoid soil compaction. I mulch mine in with straw because I want to keep that soil moisture there, knowing that they don't do well. Um, okay, so from Heidi, how long can someone accidentally keep onions in the ground for harvest? Say they're still in the ground. Ah, um, I, Pull them out, see what they look like. You know, we just went through minus 25. Hard to say if they survived that or not. But all you can do is go out there and dig them up and try. The, the problem is that if you leave them in the soil and, and come back next year and go, oh, wow, look it. The, the problem is that they, they've started to grow again. And so now they're sending out a new stalk through the center of the plant. And so that, that onion, that now year old onion is going to not have the flavor so it's it's just um you want to harvest them all in the same year if you can and and hats off to you that you still have um still harvesting and you're still cooking with them and they're just fine so good job on that fertilizer these guys are again fall into my heavy feeding category they want that 10 percent nitrogen so they want a little bit bigger boost and phosphorus 10 percent potassium and again keep the water on the ground to use drip irrigation or soaker hose and so they come in colors white yellow red um, they come in different they grow differently some of them are you get some italians that are kind of flat you get the big walla wallas and the vidalias. We can grow both of those here. Um, need micronutrients. Again, they're heavy feeders. They, they will pull a lot out of your soil. So you have to kind of keep that in mind when you're growing these guys. And I never grow them in the same place ever. I, I put a strong rotation on them. Okay. Shallots. Again, shallots are easy to grow. These are kind of the gourmet cousin of onions, and they're going to be milder. They're going to have kind of a little bit more distinct flavor, a little bit sweeter. Um, but but they're really they're good in salads. I've done them in salads, soup, stews, on a burger, the whole nine yards. So they're they're easy to grow. They come they look more like a garlic when you get them. And so you peel the cloves off and you grow each clove independently. Not a lot of yield off of them. 
if you let them grow to see, if you let them flower, that comp. So, you know, they will flower. They are whiter violet flowers in the early summer. But as soon as one of these guys starts to flower and onions will flower, I've had onions in the ground for, for 10 years. I didn't, never harvested them, but they've been in the ground for 10 years. They're a perennial at this point and they bloom. It's a clump. It's a giant clump that's almost two feet across now. And beautiful white blooms. The bees love it. But as soon as they start to flower, you lose the flavor. Um, bunching onions, um, scallions, easy to grow. Again, trying to grow onions from seed. They're such a long day from seed. I think they're like 120 days. It's just too long for us here. Yeah, um, in the Johnny's seed catalog, they talk about onions on page 73. They actually like a little cooler soil to start growing in, but they're they're all in the 100, 100 days. So again, you gotta go back and it's, it's the seed to germination. Germination is going to be 10 days. Then, and then you start counting. So you have to add like another 10 or 14 days to 100 days or 120 days. And so now you're, you're getting out of that area where you're going to have a meaningful crop. So I always, I always buy them started. So anyway, and they've got some great pictures in the Johnny's catalog on page 74 and 75 of what all these onions are going to look like at harvest. Never go wrong with onions. <clears> hey, <throat> okay. here's my peas. Pumpkins, and pumpkins are really long. I just plant them, I forget them. Bees are necessary for pollination. Again, it's a squash, a squash bee that pollinates these guys because all on all your pumpkins and some skip strawberries. Um, so a squash, a squash plant on that plant is going to have a male and a female blossom. So it's a monoecious, but they open up at different times. And so the male opens up a little later, the female opens up earlier. And, but you need the squash bee to pollinate. And a lot of people see that squash bee and they think it's a bad bug and they kill it. Eh, you should, don't, don't bring insecticides into your vegetable garden. Rare, rare, rare that you need to have an insecticide in the vegetable garden. Um, yeah, and the, and the blossoms are running out. So about 5.30 to 10.30, and after 10.30, that, that's done. And you'll have more male blossoms on your squash, especially your winter squash, in the early summer, the spring and early summer. And all of a sudden, you'll start getting more female blossoms a little bit later. And so if you're just seeing nothing but male blossoms, which are just a slender stalk, by all means, harvest those blossoms and saute them and have them for dinner. The female blossoms are going to have kind of a swollen embryonic fruit at the base. So you can't miss it. It kind of looks like there's a little marble down there. And those are the females. Don't eat them. Well, you'll eat them, but later. And just leave them on there. Make sure there's enough male blossoms around. You don't need to sell, you don't need to pollinate, hand pollinate these guys. As long as you've got flowers in your vegetable garden, the squash bees just amazingly show up and they'll pollinate all on their own. I, I don't ever worry about that. Um, watermelon, you can grow watermelon here too, by the way. You want to grow the baby ones, the uh, personal size eating ones, the like the 10, 15 pound watermelon, Roma Petralis, Black plastic, lots of water, easy to grow watermelons, cantaloupe, muskmelons, all, you can grow all those here. And then mid-season garden. So this goes back to a question that was asked earlier. 
Um, you can you can start replanting July beets, carrots, cauliflower, Swiss chard, and oops, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, um, I've planted. I have planted potatoes in September and I have plant and I have harvested potatoes at Christmas. Um, muskmelon seeds. Okay. Let's see. Um, can you drop on this or homework? There is homework, but I'll give it to you on Monday. Don't worry about it. Drive safe. So muskmelon. So, if you go to page 71 in your Johnny Seed catalog, they will list all the different melons that you can eat, can grow. Uh, gives you, now, and these guys also like a little bit more neutral to alkaline soil. Keep in mind, most of these melons. Watermelon, all are native to the desert. And so they want their soil hot. So black plastic is a must. Um, full sun, consistent water, absolute must. But again, look at the days to maturity. And that's how you're going to gauge which ones you're going to start and grow. I've tried starting them in the house and transplanting. And I've, I've done that and then a couple, a little bit farther over, I do, um, I start from seed and it's a toss up. They both kind of come out at the same time. So there's one called Golden Giant, 60 days. It's a Korean melon, gets about 10 inches long, so it's more cylindrical. Forms well in cool weather. Harvest from fruits turn slightly golden, and um, you cut them from the vine. So there's, so you have some choices in what you can grow here. But again, grow them on black plastic, grow them up a trellis. Then on page seventy-two, you have cantaloupe and honeydew, and. These are all in the 70 days. I would probably lean towards something that's like 71 days. When you start getting into the 80 day, even though it says sugar cube, which is really tempting, right? I would probably lean a little way from it unless you wanna wait till August or September to eat that. Okay. Okay, so that's that's the program. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? Parsnips. Yes, parsnips are one that you can, the seeds are pretty cool. They're these flat little disc-like things. And they're kind of slow growing, huge roots on them, absolutely huge. I've left them in the ground and left them over winter and they still do well. Okay, guess I don't talk about parsnips. I know I had them in here at one time and, and I got too many people going, how do you even eat those? How do you prepare them? And it's like, he had a German grandmother who would slice them, boil them, and then fry them with butter. Everything's better with butter, right? Page 77, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So parsnips, again, the growing guide on the bottom of the page is amazing. They like cool soil. So these are ones that you plant a little earlier. They are they are in the ground for a long, long time. 
if they go to seed, they'll self seed and you will be harvest. You'll be having parsnips for years. So if, if you don't mind that by all means, <laughs> otherwise don't go to seed. They can handle a frost. They can handle snow on them. I said, I've had them in the ground for a couple of years and harvest them. They did just fine. Parsnip pie. Yeah, parsnips are good. They're an Indian food also. So they're, they're kind of multitaskers culturally, culinarily. I, I grew up with them boiled and fried. I thought that was just heavenly. <laughs> Easy to grow. Plant them and you kind of put them off to the side. You don't mess with them. You don't, you don't have to worry about them. They keep them on a watering system. Easy peasy to grow. Just really easy. Okay. So I'm running over a little bit. Anything else? December harvest for potatoes. How does this happen without killing them? I mulch them in very, very well. So Father Joseph, I had access to lots of straw and I mulched them in and then I covered them with a net so that the straw wouldn't blow away. And I just happened to have a fairly mild winter. We didn't have that minus 25, did have snow on top of them. Snow is, snow is, is a good thing to have both temperature and Dug them up on Christmas, and that was wonderful. So on Monday, I'll have a uh, assignment, just a fun assignment for you guys to do, and we'll look at a few other things. Hopefully, the weather is is good, and I think Brian Spady comes over on Monday. I think that's what my schedule says. Yeah, soils. So we'll bring your soil, bring your soil, and we'll see what your soil is, and then you'll learn. You'll have a good takeaway with that one because you'll be able to go anywhere in your garden, your soil you're dealing with. And, and how to mess with it. And then if you want precise numbers, you can send it in for soil testing. And yeah, seed catalogs, seed catalogs should teach you something. And so that's why I like Johnny's and Territorial and been using them both for over, well, for 21 years now. But lots of information. Like I said, if you had to buy this as a book, but my cover is a little different. If you had to buy this as a book, it would be extremely expensive. So again, um, it's free. <laughs> Any information is priceless, right? Okay, any other thoughts, questions? Um, otherwise, I'm nine minutes over and the good news is that you're all home so you don't have to drive or go out in the cold. Be careful for the rest of the week and I will see you all on Monday. Do you have a soil probe? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Are we bringing soil Good samples night, everybody. on Monday, Catherine? Are we bringing soil samples on Monday? Great. Monday, go, go try to find it under that snow drift and chip it out. Yep.